Good morning. Anyone wants to test out their camera or get their slides tested out, you're welcome to do so now. Okay, Mike, this is um, David Kring. Let me go ahead and check my slides first. That's the okay. co-chair. I want to be really busy. <laughs> so make sure I get this working. Absolutely. And the other chair is uh, Sherry Achilles. Yeah, Sherry. Okay, keep an eye out for her. So I'll basically just be making people co-hosts as their presenting time comes up. Um, and I think the rest is up to you. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so did the slides pop up on your end? Yes, I see them perfectly. Okay, so I'll stop sharing and Great. Okay, and our first talk is going to be by you and then followed by Noah. Great. Okay, um, I'll be on the line. Um, holler if you need me. Um, and uh, we'll have a good session today. Okay, thank you. Excuse me, would it be possible for me to see if my slides can be uh, shared properly? I'm one of the uh, lightning talks. Yeah, absolutely. This is Christopher. Yeah, this is Christopher. Oh, Christopher, sorry. <laughs> no worries. Please go ahead. Funky. Thank you. Uh, right now, it has the host's disabled participant oh, screen I'm sorry. share. That's, that's on me. One second. Okay, you should be able to now. And good morning, Sherry. How you doing? Hi, how's it going? Good. Just gonna make you a co-host. There we go. Great, thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Okay, Christopher, I can see you've started screen sharing and there your slides are. Great. Awesome. Thank you very much. I'll stop sharing that. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, David, quick question for you. Yes. Do you plan to use the uh, the timers? Uh, no, I, I not. So, uh, okay. For the the two talks that I was responsible for, I have a my own timer right here. But okay. I'm not going to try to project anything. I I like that because I uh, think I'm going to do the same thing. <laughs> so we'll just do a verbal warnings if. You are good with that. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm, I'm fine. Okay, great. So per our plan, um, you have the microphone that is, um, you know, at two minutes of or whenever you think is appropriate, go through the introductory things uh, for yes. the whole team. And, um, and in the first set of talks after I finish speaking, then I'll, I'll monitor the chat while you um, monitor the speaker in time. Okay, sounds great.
So, uh, David, you mentioned you're responsible for two talks. Could you um, fill me in on that? Is that a... I, I'm sorry, in introducing two talks. Uh, yeah, we were that. talking about um, the division and uh, uh, co-host, co-chair responsibilities. Okay, no worries, thanks. Just wanna check the schedule there. Okay, and just FYI, I'm gonna start recording now. Just so we get a jump on it, you will hear a lovely prompt about it. Okay, thank you. And Sherry, recording I have not in yet progress. Seen, I've not yet seen uh, Noah and Oz show up. Um, hopefully, the second and third speakers show up soon. I hope so too, <laughs> or else it'll be an interesting session. Okay, it looks like Noah's in the building. And so is Oz. Great. Thank you, Mike. And Mike, quick question for you. I kind of got kicked off real quick. Uh, could you make me co-host again, if possible? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay, should be all set now. Great, thanks. All right, we'll go ahead and kick off our session with a, a few announcements before we get going. Uh, so welcome to the crewed exploration, uh, astronaut tra training in ConOps. Uh, I'm Sheree Ackles, one of your co-chairs, and I'm here with David Crean, who will uh, also be co-chairing this session. Uh, so we have a few announcements we wanna talk uh, about first. So all of our talks will be uh, eight minutes with two minutes for questions, and we'll have six of those. Um, and we'll follow those up with um, some two minute lightning talks. Um, so just to, to keep in mind uh, our student poster lightning talks, um, those will be in, uh, you know, in conjunction with the posters that are later on. So please go ahead and, and plan on visiting those posters. Um, after our talks, we'll have a longer discussion period. So if you think about questions um, that you didn't get to ask uh, after one of the presentations, please save those. 
Um, you can also type them in uh, to our chat session. And if you do have questions, we ask that you put a, a queue around those in brackets and let us know who that question is for. Um, but please keep in mind that uh, we want our discussions to be inclusive, constructive, and to uh, be in accordance with our code of conduct. Uh, we want to uh, respect the intellectual property rights of each presenter. Um, and so please don't share screenshots uh, of their presentations without their permission. Um, so participants uh, should feel free to close the chat window if it's too distracting. Um, and our chairs, uh, David and I, will announce um, and speak our questions out loud for everyone to hear um, in case uh, the chat is getting a little too annoying for everyone else. And so with that, we're right on time. And I'm going to introduce my co-chair. Uh, he'll be our first talk in this session, David Kring. Uh, the title is Geologic Exploration Training for Lunar Surface Operations. And he's uh, presenting uh, on behalf of co-authors uh, Looper, Ney, and uh, Oh, I'm sorry, David, uh, Janico. You can correct that if I was wrong. So go ahead and, and kick that off. Okay, uh, Sherry, can you see my slides? Um, I cannot yet. Okay, that's what I thought. I had a little bleep here. So. All right, perfect. Okay, uh, yeah, that's Barbara Janoyko uh, here at the Johnson Space Center. That's how you say her name. So uh, let me uh, launch quickly into uh, the presentation with this um, first slide. I need to explain that um, th the project that I wanna be summarizing today was um, uh, requested by Administrator Bridenstine before um, he left the agency. Uh, he asked for some input regarding lunar surface operations. And so our survey sponsored team, uh, the LPI JSC, Center for Lunar Science and Exploration uh, produced um, a training report, which I'm going to summarize today. Uh, this is the, the title of the report. It's called Training for Lunar Surface Operations with the, the same authors that you see on, saw on the title uh, slide. What we tried to do in this report, um, or what we were asked to do in this report, is to summarize uh, the lessons learned during six years of work with the Constellation program about a decade ago. Uh, what uh, some of you may remember is that during Constellation, we were planning to land on the rim of Shackleton Crater near the South Pole uh, and basically begin an exploration of the lunar South Polar region uh, just as is being described for Artemis. And so a lot of the lessons learned during constellations are directly applicable to um, Artemis. And I'm really happy to, to say, if you've not spied it on the title page there, that the lead flight director for Apollo 15 and 17, uh, Jerry Griffin, wrote a foreword uh, for the report. So I want to walk you through uh, some of the findings. Uh, finding number one is that the Artemis 3 landing site and an Artemis base camp within six degrees of the lunar south pole will be in an impact crater terrain. And thus, crews should be given basic geologic training and conduct EVA simulations in appropriate analog uh, terrains. Here is um, some training sites that we've used before in the American Southwest, included among them, or, or of course, uh, Meteor Crater, which is a classic all the way that goes back to Apollo. We also have in West Texas, uh, the Sierra Madera, uh, impact crater, uh, and we have schooner crater at the Nevada uh, test site. Um, this is another way of looking at some of those uh, analog sites. So here's a picture of the South Pole, and I have some arrows pointing to a variety of craters within the South Pole region. And I'll just kind of point out some of the, the analogies that we have. So Meteor Crater, it has the same shape as Shackleton at the South Pole. It's really the best locality in the world for impact crater basics and was, as you know, a, an Apollo training site. Uh, we might actually want to go afar to, for example, the Reese Crater in Germany. It's similar in size to Shackleton. It's similar in shape to Haworth, Shoemaker, and Faustini and contains ejected blocks like we see uh, and been mapping at, at Shackleton. It also was an Apollo training site. 
And then Sierra Madera, Texas, closer to the JSC than the Reese Crater, is also a, a, a structure that approaches the size of Shackleton and contains an uplifted central peak like other polar craters uh, like Amundsen. Finding number two is that based on Apollo experience, classroom, laboratory, and field-based training for lunar surface conditions may exceed a thousand hours. So this is a non-trivial um, amount of time needed for this um, uh, uh, to address this issue. And it really needs to begin uh, immediately to meet the Artemis schedule. Uh, crew, once selected for a mission, may need to engage in monthly field uh, exercises. Here's an example of what the Apollo 16 crew uh, experienced after they were selected. Uh, there was surface related training. Um, there were 39 sessions for a total of 142 hours. There were simulations using a mission control center. Uh, there was some orbital geology studies, some flyover studies, 36 days of field trips, uh, classroom geology lectures and, and studies of rocks for a total of um, 110 days of training uh, prior to the Apollo 16 flight. Um, it's important to um, point out that the South Pole resides on the rim of Shackleton Crater, again, an impact crater terrain, and that impact event excavated four times 10 to the 11th cubic meters and nearly a billion metric tons of rock, okay? Knowing which rock samples to collect from those deposits takes skill that will need to be developed. Moreover, the Shackleton impact event and other impact events in the regions modify the distribution of volatiles and understanding those impact imposed consequences and evaluating them while engaged in EVA will take skill that needs to be developed through the training that we've just described. And I I'm gonna quote here Jack Schmidt, something that he said following uh, his mission. A lunar field geologist must always be aware that time is relentless, that consumables are limited, that fatigue can be fatal, and that usually returning to a location is unlikely. These cognitive realities add to the normal intellectual workload of doing field work. For that reason, he added planning, voice communication, automated location, and sample documentation, and most importantly, field experience all take on an even greater importance than normal. Finding three. In addition to monthly field exercises, complex mission simulations should be conducted in analog terrains with the integrated expertise of a broad group that involves the astronaut office, astronaut trainers of all types, uh, geologists involved in surface operations, uh, lunar sample ana analysts, in situ resource specialists when appropriate, equipment designers, flight controllers, and, and management. A simulation with all of those people involved will uh, undoubtedly uncover unanticipated challenges, produce a well-working team, and give that team the resiliency to successfully resolve unexpected conditions that may arise during a lunar surface mission. Finding One four, minute. Constellation mission simulations demonstrated an integrated flight and science operations architecture greatly enhances mission productivity. What do we mean by that? Uh, in Constellation, we um, developed a science operation center that was integrated with the standard flight operations center. And so when crew went EVA, there was a handoff from the flight director to a science leader or science lead, and the scientists spoke directly to the crew. That greatly enhanced uh, mission efficiency and productivity. Uh, because of time, I'm monitoring here, I'm gonna skip over a couple of slides and go to uh, finding number five. Apollo experience and the nature of Artemis polar terrain suggests the science team supporting training activities and subsequent lunar surface operations need um, a management team that has experience in the impact crater terrains that I've described already. Uh, analytical experience with lunar samples, we have the Apollo collection and lunar meteorite collections. Uh, experience in analyzing polar volatiles uh, and um, experience with the uh, polar uh, south polar terrain. Finding six, 
Constellation mission simulations demonstrated EVA training for crew is evolving from task-specific training needed for shuttle international space station activities to a skills-based training model needed for lunar surface operation. Skills-based training will become increasingly important as the duration of lunar surface times increase. And that's illustrated with this diagram here, which I've pulled from a paper by uh, Nay and Looper published during the Constellation era. If and finally, that, seven, that'd be great. thank you. The development of EVA training needs to be initiated immediately to meet the Artemis schedule. It's important to develop the operational concept and applicable skills in parallel with hardware development. And so here are my final thoughts in the last few seconds. Surface science traverses are a system level activity, not a subsystem activity. Science ops are similar to flight ops in scope and complexity. Field geology is more, know, is more than knowing how to use a tool. Lunar surface science traverses are not geologic mapping exercises. Sample collection is the most effective way to produce transformative scientific advances. Field geology and surface science traverses are skill-based activities. We need to train to meet mission objectives, but we also need to be prepared to encounter something completely different. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was a really great talk. Um, if anyone has questions, let's put those in the chat. And Noah, if you'll go ahead and see if you can um, display or share your slides. Um, I think we'll move along for time, but we'll come back with uh, questions that we have for David. Great. And hopefully you can see something that resembles a messy computer screen. Uh, we, it doesn't look messy, but we can see your slides. No. Um, so I'll go ahead and introduce uh, Noah's talk here. He'll be talking about uh, Artemis Field Geology Investigations, Lessons Learned from Apollo, and uh, other co-authors are himself and uh, Schmidt. So go ahead, Noah. Okay, thanks so much, Shri. And I, I you know, I, I, David touched on many of the points that I wanted to make. So this is gonna reinforce uh, most of what he said. So, so hang tight, but uh, I, I wanted to use this opportunity here at Surrey Forum to talk a little bit about you know, what worked in Apollo and what's going to be done, I think, differently going forward in Artemis. Although I got to be very honest, I can only speak, I cannot, I can only speak for myself. There have been a number of recent presentations given in the last pandemic months on, on the, the status of the training program. Back in April, Cindy Evans gave a talk. There's a YouTube link, and if you can see the QR codes for that. Um, on, on the current status of the training program. And then um, more recently, just a few weeks ago, Kelsey Young and co-authors gave a presentation on training at the uh, workshop uh, on terrestrial analogs for planetary exploration. So I, I, I will not speak directly to what's been presented there, but I highly suggest everybody go and, and watch those presentations. What I'd like to do though, is talk a little bit about Apollo and really leverage a, a paper that Jack uh, and co-authors published back in, in 2011, the GSA special issue. Those special issues become the most important job that interlibrary loan librarians go after. Uh, if you haven't read this paper, definitely go and track it down because it really presents a nice overview of what happened in Apollo and from, from training to site selection. I'm gonna focus on, on the training component and really the, some of the three big takeaways, particularly relevant to training. Are, are you know what happened to get astronauts into the field, get astronauts exposed to scientists, and get a crew, a team working together. And there's a quote in the paper that I think is really important: is that that you know field training was to reduce, reduce risk to crews and increase crew and ground team productivity. I think we've all learned over the last year and a half now how difficult it is for teams to work together if you're not together. And so when you do these training simulations, when you're together in the field, you develop a camaraderie, a level of communications and the ability to work together. Um, on the right-hand side is archival footage of the, the one field training session the Apollo 11 crew took um, in West Texas in February of 1969, showing you know, what they were doing to, to, to begin to work together as a team um, in, in a geologic environment. That wasn't, of course, the only time that both astronauts had been in the field uh, getting exposed to geology, but in terms of an actual simulation, that one experience was it. So first, let's start with with classroom training. And and you know, as uh, David pointed out, you know, classroom training is going to be is, is going to be very important for Apollo. It was 
teaching people geology. The textbooks that the crews or the, the classes were, were given were these wonderful art relics of an uh, early era of, of geology, principles of geology, which talked in dismissive terms of the philosophy and theory of, of plate tectonics. You can imagine now crews that are being trained and classes that are being exposed to geology in classroom settings are not only benefiting from the 50 years of, of science and, and lessons learned from, from Apollo, but also the, 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 the explosion of understanding of how planets work in the context of the moon in relation to the earth and other solar system bodies. These classroom trainings set the stage for the, the quote, show and tell style um, geologic expeditions that the, the astronaut classes would have taken. These covered everything from geologic processes, fundamentals, the impact cratering lesson that Gene Shoemaker is giving in this March 1967 film clip, uh, to the, the nitty gritty details of mineralogy and petrology. And, and as, as, as David pointed out, these lessons are described in, in some detail in the reports described at the bottom of my, of my slide. This set up the, the, the stage for, for field training, for taking astronauts and putting them in geologic environments of exposing them to the, the lingo, the, the, the tools, the, the expertise, how we go about conducting field work um, in a geologic environment. Um, this level of training, this exposure was sort of the, the, the stage for, for Apollos 11 and 12 and by Apollo 13 had developed a much more robust, um, uh, mature field training investigation. And, 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 and Finney describes here a little bit of kind of the premise behind what they were going after um, in this particular uh, investigation in 1964 to Big Bend. And you'll see uh, actually some faces in the, in, the, in the video that become familiar. Bill Mulberger there um, talking the geology with Scott Carpenter and, and a shirtless Pete Conrad. And that part also becomes important because you're not only exposing them to scientists, you're to the field sites, you're exposing the, the, the astronauts to the scientists, to their peers, people that will help them walk around on the surface of the moon. The video clip at right, shows Dale Jackson, that sort of unheralded hero of the Apollo geology program, talking with Dave Scott, Michael Collins, and Roger Chaffee just outside of Flagstaff, Arizona. And, and as Jack pointed out in that 2011 paper, it was important for the, the, the astronauts to get exposed to the scientists, and in some cases, develop a mentorship, mentee relationship with these geologists, people that they could trust in, in confidence to talk through the concerns, questions, issues that they may be having. And so not only is it important for, for crew to build a, a, a comfort level with the geology, but also comfort level with the scientists that they'll be working uh, hand in glove with uh, during their expedition to the moon. And, and so it's important that we also consider that, you know, the astronauts are learning. And so this learning process has to happen also in somewhat informal ways through discussions of, you know, well, why did you pick up this sample when we asked you to collect uh, representative samples. What did, what led you uh, walking through the thought process of, of what the crew is doing when they're in these field expeditions? As I mentioned before, you know, there was a significant change uh, around the Apollo 13 training for how we approach, um, how we, how they approached the simulation-based training. And you can see even in Apollo 17, the, the use of a, a simulated lunar Lander, of course, there's also simulated rovers that they, they use. Part of this training include the entire crew and, and most importantly were the Capcoms, the people that they were gonna be talking to in Houston. And again, part of this building a relationship a rapport and a cadence, understanding when to interrupt, when to interject and how to basically work together, even if you're remote, something that we've all come uh, far too accustomed to. The field sites that were selected yeah. for these training exercises reflected the analogs for parts of what they, the crew would be exposed to. So in the case of Apollo 17, land, landslide deposits or, 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 or volcanic deposits. And as David correctly pointed out, of course, impact craters of, of varying uh, degradation states. Oh, I would also like to point out that in this field campaign, this, this particular training exercise of Apollo 17, uh, Pro President Nixon's science advisor was there. And these become, I don't want to call it, uh, not PR uh, opportunities, but opportunities to bring in people to learn more about what the program is uh, about. Uh, lastly, uh, the Artemis training program, and as, as was highlighted in, um, um, actually in, in Kelsey Young's presentation earlier this uh, month uh, or last month, uh, the four, three phases of training uh, go from classroom and, and preliminary field expeditions to really the, the hardcore 
training for, for specific missions, especially once, um, once condition, uh, a landing site is selected. We also have to consider what conditions to re recreate. No one location on the earth will, will perfectly summarize and synthesize what will be exposed to on the moon. I, I, I believe exposing the crew to what the, the extreme illumination conditions of the, the South Pole, the moon will be like, will be very important just for understanding how to work in this incredibly dynamic environment. And so I, I've brainstormed a few other places there or types of environments, but certainly we can spend hours and hours discussing more uh, down the line. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Noah. That was a really awesome talk. Um, I think we'll move on, but feel free to put questions in uh, the chat area. And I already see we have some populating there and we'll come back to those during the discussion. Um, Oz, would you like to try and uh, share your screen and I'll give a quick introduction. So our next speaker is Gordon Ozinski. Uh, his title is Robotic Precursor Assistant and uh, Postcursor Activities in Support of Human Lunar Exploration, Lessons Learned from Analog Missions. So take it away. All right, thank you. And it's a pleasure to be here uh, this morning. Uh, I think it's still morning uh, where I am too. Um, and uh, this follows on nicely from uh, David and Noah's presentation on you know, field geology training. Um, of course, one of the big things that Noah didn't talk about that has changed since Apollo is how far technology has come. And so essentially the take home message, if I run out of time at the end, is that you know, my view, and I think we can support this with lessons learned from Apollo missions, is that we should be sending robots in advance. We should be working with rovers while they're uh, uh, humans on the moon and uh, leaving the robots behind to do post-cursor activities. Uh, I would like to thank all the co-authors uh, on the actual presentation here. And uh, also, if I can get the slide to move on, uh, a whole number of uh, other participants, uh, well over 100 people who have participated in the various analog missions that I'll be talking about. So thank you to all of those who are staffing mission control uh, and doing uh, field support. So I'd love the opportunity to talk about, you know, all of the analog missions that we've been leading here at the University of Western Ontario in London. Uh, but I'm going to focus on what I think is the most relevant one uh, here today and for this audience. Uh, all of these in uh, one way or another have been funded by the Canadian Space Agency. So thank you to them for having the foresight to fund uh, these analog activities. And so today I'd like to take uh, myself back actually and you back about a decade when we carried out um, uh, over two years uh, robotic precursor and postcursor analog missions at the Mastastin Lake impact structure in Labrador. So these were a series of lunar analog missions in support of uh, human sample returns. So that was the focus. Uh, the scenario was that in 2010, uh, we had a robotic precursor mission carried out over about a month. Uh, and then in 2011, uh, we went in with the, uh, the simulated astronauts and also carried out some post-cursor activities. You can see the science questions that we went in with in the bottom left. Um, we had a, a remote mission control. Uh, so this was a fully simulated end-to-end -end mission. We had the mission control located uh, here in London, Ontario. To follow on from uh, David's talk, you know, uh, and, and Noah's as well, you know, heavily impacted terrains is what we're going to be looking at on the moon. Uh, the Mastastin Lake impact structure in Canada, I would argue, is uh, the one of the best, if not the best, scientific analog for lunar craters. It's a complex impact crater, about 28 kilometers across, uh, and uh, the main target rock is a northosite, so it's an excellent lunar highland um, analog. We have a central uplift that you can see in the middle of the lake. Yes, there is a lake, not a fantastic lunar analog, but it also provides some challenges for navigation. But we have a northosite in the form of shocked rocks. We have impact ejector preserved. We have impact melt generated from a, a northosite precursor. So it's a really excellent analog, pretty remote, and still a lot of science to be done there, which means we can have science-driven analog activities. So jumping into the results, uh, precursor data, what was the value? Um, basically, the, the bottom line is that of all the data sets we collected during the precursor missions, you know, handheld spectrometer data, geophysics data, it was really the, uh, the high resolution panoramic imagery and LIDAR data that proved most useful uh, for the follow on missions. It helped in terrain uh, orientation, um, but it really helped in traverse planning for the human missions in the following year. 
And so what we have here is a quick bird image that we uh, essentially um, you know, decrease the resolution to match what we have the highest resolution of for the moon. And you, know, you can see some features. Hope you can see my mouse. I know it doesn't come over too well in Zoom. Uh, there's some perhaps faint layering. If you can you know, uh, pick this out, there's a brighter outcrop here. Um, but if I zoom into a LiDAR image, uh, this actual hill here is called Discovery Hill. It's in some of Richard Greaves' earliest papers, and it's one of the most spectacular occurrences of, of columnar jointed impact melt in the world in an impact crater. You know, so this is about a hundred meter high cliff of impact melt that you, you really have a hard time seeing in this uh, you know, top down satellite image. Uh, if we move on again, you know, this is some high resolution panoramic images showing this outcrop. And so, you know, this enabled the team both in real time during the precursor missions, but also afterwards to come up with a whole bunch of hypotheses about what they were seeing based on this on the ground uh, imagery. Um, I'm not going to delve into it too much today, but of course, LIDAR is, uh, again, something that, you know, we've been working on here quite a bit. And uh, it also is suitable for addressing some of the illumination issues on the moon. And, you know, just to quickly go backwards here, uh, this type of data set, uh, this could have been completely in shadow, even on the ground. And so LID LIDAR data is definitely something that I would argue should be on future uh, robotic precursor missions. Moving into assistance, you know, so this is something I think a lot of us have thought about. You know, I am a field geologist by background and training. First glance, it's like, oh, I don't want any robots with me taking my time away. Um, but we did kind of look at, uh, and I have a few stats to share with you. So, you know, having a robot in the field with you does take some of your time away as a human from your activities. And, uh, you know, the, some of the, the percentage here is about 13% of the time during this EVA was spent on working with the rover, in this case, actually driving the rover, teaching it some paths. Um, but we gained an additional 546 minutes of robotic operations during that same EVA. Uh, and then I'll get onto the next slide. That doesn't even include uh, the, the value of the post-cursor activities. And in particular, um, uh, being able, having the rover there with the humans, uh, it's a lot easier for a nav rover navigation. You can teach the rover some paths that it can then drive back autonomously uh, afterwards. So essentially, there was you know greater science return. This is something that I think you know this was something um, that we looked at very briefly you know during this one analog mission, and I think it does deserve to be looked at in the future. Uh, is, uh, you know, how to, to really optimize uh, the, the robotic uh, human interactions in the field. Moving on to post-cursor work, um, you know, huge benefits, uh, you know, multiple things. First, in being able to revisit, you know, we were only able to do it over days, but even that was valuable. But imagine having a rover there at the same site, uh, weeks and months, you're starting to analyze the samples that we've brought back. You know, you've got more questions, more hypotheses to be tested. So the rover can go back to previously visited sites. Um, but it also then enables um, the rover to extend, uh, you know, the, the going to previous sites that were not able to be visited by the humans. Um, and, you know, this, the teaching repeat uh, functionality that we have in robotics now is quite new a decade ago. It's, you know, fairly commonplace now. Essentially, once a rover is driven the path once, it can basically do it on its own without GPS. Uh, again, really optimizing and increasing the, uh, uh, the value. And I think uh, I see you popping up, Sherry. That is my last slide. And hopefully there's a time minute or two for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Oz. That was perfect timing. Uh, and we do have a couple minutes for questions. If anyone wants to uh, type in the chat. So I know some chat messages for previous speakers too, but uh, yes. <laughs> questions if we got time. All right. Well, Oz, I have a question for you. So, um, you know, you talked about wanting to do more of human-based field um, operations rather than take, um, you know, it's a lot of time to, to use a robot. Um, were there certain things that you really enjoyed about working with the robotic operations that you felt um, are going to be really useful? Uh, yeah. Um, um, I mean, I do think, um, you know, optimizing 
this is where, you know, I think the mission control architecture for this that, you know, we had fairly simply back then will be very important, you know. Um, do you need a parallel? Uh, well, how, how do you structure that, right? Is it the same science back room um, controlling the uh, and directing the rover while the human astronaut is there in the field? You know, what do you do when the astronaut was sleeping, which is not something we tested at Mistastin because it was dark. Um, but, you know, we're looking at going back to one of Noah's points, you know, going back to high Arctic uh, analog sites here in Canada where we can do 24 seven operations and really thinking about, you know, because let's say we got six hours of EVA, uh, what we didn't do, you know, yeah. What do you do overnight with that robot while the humans are sleeping? Uh, and so I think a lot of the emphasis is going to be on figuring out how we structure the uh, yeah, mission control and the science back room here on earth to really optimize all of that. And the best way to do that is to go out and do it uh, here on earth. That's great. Thank you. And we had a couple questions coming in that uh, I think will be a great jump off uh, for our discussions later on. So we'll save those. Um, and thank you. So we'll move on to our, uh, our next speaker. Uh, we have Janine Moses. If you want to go ahead and try and uh, share your screen. So uh, Janine will be talking about heads up display technology for deep space spacewalks. That can be a mouthful. <laughs> and looks like we can see your slides now. And Janine, it looks like we can't quite hear you. Janine, why don't you unshare your screen while you work on that? So while Janine's trying to uh, share her screen, want to uh, make sure that everyone has an opportunity to ask questions and so we can have a really great discussion later on. Uh, so in the chat window, if you'll preface your question with a cue and also tell us who you're asking that question for or who you want to direct it towards, uh, that would be great. Uh, we know we have some people that are answering questions in the chat, which is awesome too. So thank you guys for keeping an eye on that. Um, and you know, some of those are really interesting and we may revisit in the discussion. I know I'd like to hear a little more about how NASA and ESA are, uh, could work together in terms of astronaut training. Uh, is anyone able to hear me now? There we go. We okay, sorry about that. that. No problem. All right, let me try this one more time. Okay. Okay. All right, and can you see uh, the full screen presentation? Yes, everything looks great. Okay. Take it away. All right, excellent, sorry about that. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Janine Moses. I'm an intern at KBR for NASA Johnson Space Center. I'm also a graduate student at UC Davis. I work uh, with Dr. Steve Robinson, who's here today as well. Um, I'm going to tell you about the development of a helmet-mounted display, or HMD as we call it, that's currently being tested in NASA's Neutral Buoyancy Lab as a prototype for head-up displays uh, that's part of the REVEALS grant. So um, in this presentation, we'll go through the project's foundation, um, how it started out, and discuss some of the hardware and software involved with this helmet-mounted display. Um, as well as some of the results from an initial HMD testing last year and what happens next and where this is going um, in the future. So um, as we've all been discussing, as we go deeper into space, um, comm delays will reduce mission control's involvement um, and astronauts need to become more autonomous uh, during spacewalks and surface exploration AVAs. 
So head-up displays will be crucial to providing astronauts with real-time information about their EVA so that, and their surroundings so that they can uh, make decisions more independently. Um, our specific project, like I mentioned, the Helmet Mounted Display, or HMD, um, is a collaboration between UC Davis for the Reveals Grant as well as NASA Johnson Space Center. And it is a low-tech and low-cost solution that enables real-time information to be displayed to crew members during EVA training. Um, we've been testing this in, in the neutral buoyancy lab. Um, this is a picture from last year's testing. That's me here holding up um, the lab logo that I'm a part of, uh, Dr. Robinson's lab at UC Davis. So um, two years ago, uh, UC Davis um, alum, oops, sorry. UC Davis alum Caden Jefferson and I created a very rudimentary prototype using uh, Dr. Robinson's old T-38 flight helmet, as you can see here. Um, and over the course of 2020 and throughout this global pandemic, Ruby Houchins, who's another UC Davis intern at NASA with me, um, she and I transformed this into a fully operational and voice-controlled helmet-mounted display, which you can see here um, in this picture, which is on this uh, subject's right side of their helmet. Um, and we did this under the guidance of our mentors at NASA, James Stoffel, Jocelyn Dunn, and Dr. Robinson. So first, a little bit about the hardware we have. Um, the display screen is a commercial OLED, and it was waterproofed uh, in-house. The display itself is only one by one inch, so there's not much real estate, um, but it is externally mounted to the um, EMU, to the spacesuit visor using suction cups, which work great underwater, but not great in space. Um, and the swing arm, uh, this mounting option, positions the display about six to eight inches from the user's eyes, so they can read alphanumeric text and look at um, uh, kind of simple or basic images on the display. Um, the other mounting option uh, is the uh, surface mount, and that's uh, integrated in the same, with the same display screen. And it's a simple chassis mounted as far back as possible on the helmet bubble. And when this display is mounted, it's, um, it only is used to show flashing colors or shapes as a method of testing a subject's response to peripheral signaling. And I'll talk more a little bit about that uh, later. This swing arm on the left, as you can see here, it can be mounted in the lower left or upper left or lower right or upper right positions. And the subjects and crew members got to choose their uh, position for mounting it. Um, so when the swing arm is being used, the helmet mounted display can show uh, these following modes. And um, we've got a little welcome screen like this. Uh, it shows their real-time metabolic rate data, which is a reflection of their energy expenditure, um, both as a numerical value and as a bar graph. Um, it also shows the phased elapsed time, or PET, and then there are three timer functions they can use to, um, like throughout the EVA training in the NBL. Um, there are also two images that show simulated um, location or translation paths on the ISS. Uh, they're very basic diagrams and they're just static images. Um, and then for the surface mount, the, this picture on the lower left, um, when that is being used, the two display modes that are shown are either a flashing blue square or a small uh, flashing yellow circle. Um, when these were shown, the crew members were asked to inform us if and when they noticed um, any of these flashing display modes. And these are meant, like I said, for peripheral signaling research so that we can explore the minimum amount of alert uh, required and, and by extension, the minimum cognitive workload that can be used to communicate something to a crew member. So um, the MBL, the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, is a high fidelity uh, EVH training analog. Uh, it mimics microgravity and it has a one-to-one -one scale mock-up of the International Space Station inside of its Olympic-sized Olympic uh, swimming pool. Um, so <clears throat> it, uh, HMD went through comprehensive and extensive collaboration between our team and all the folks at the MBL to ensure that we can essentially piggyback onto typical NBL training runs and have crew members utilize HMD as a training aid. Um, I have two videos here. I realized that I don't think my um, 
NASA laptop will permit me to share sound. But um, this shows an image here um, of um, this is an image of a uh, suited subject uh, with the welcome screen on the display that you can see over here. Um, and you can't hear the sound, but they do ask for they they do um, use voice control and change the uh, display from the welcome screen to uh, the static image um, over here. So there's another one, um, and this one is a crew member where they ask uh, to show the phase elapsed time, and then you and then it will change um, in a couple seconds, and you can sort of see. Um, and the, the, the reflection as well um, of the display changing to uh, PET or phase elapsed time. It shows zero because this is right when they were um, egressing the airlock um, in the beginning of the EVA training run. So um, let's see. So HMD was tested during five NBL runs, and there were two subjects uh, during each run, so there were 10 users total. Um, the next few slides show a few different um, sets of results we got uh, back from the uh, crew members and suited subjects. So I'm going to go through these fairly quickly because I want to um, be mindful of the time. I'm sorry about that. Um, but there were several considerations that crew members uh, were taking into account when choosing where they chose to have this mount positioned. Um, and that was good to know for future XCMU head-up display development. Um, in addition, uh, most crew members rated metabolic rate as both um, probably or certainly useful, as well as acceptable or excellent visibility. And the phase elapsed time, which was another real-time training aid, um, was also rated as useful and acceptable or excellent visibility. Um, I want to note that... Um, there was one instance where a crew member had a discomfort in the spacesuit, and they were debating about continuing the NBL run or coming up uh, to the pool deck to get their suit readjusted. And they utilized the display, and they asked to show PET, and they saw it was still early on in the, in the NBL training run, and they decided to come up and get their suit readjusted. And that was a great example for us of um, crew members using HMD on their own without um, – the team having to prompt them to use it um, as a training aid. If we can go ahead and wrap up, Janine, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay. Um, so in terms of what's next for this, um, this summer we're currently testing. Um, we've got a test on Friday at the NBL, and we're adding additional display modes, and we're hoping to extend this application to other environments, both in the or other suits in the NBL and other environments such as the. Um, Argos, um, which is the active response gravity offload system that will be used for future um, Artemis training. Um, before I end, I just want to acknowledge all of these groups. Um, we could not have done this without your help and enthusiasm um, and uh, mentorship. So uh, thank you very much. And um, this is just a, a, a GIF of Ruby and I um, in the MBL a couple of days ago after we were testing some, uh, some HMD hardware. Okay, Janine, uh, thank you very much uh, for that presentation. Um, I'm going to take over the, the chair here for a moment because um, I have an opportunity to introduce my co-chair. Um, Sherry, are you ready to present? There you go. Your slides are up. The floor is yours. All right, thank you uh, so much, David. Um, so I'm gonna jump right in and talk about uh, some work we're doing with the RISE 2 survey team. Um, so the overall goal of uh, the RISE survey team is to understand uh, the surface and samples from uh, the moon, near Earth asteroids, Phobos and Deimos. And one of the main uh, research uh, themes for RISE 2 is to conduct um, and develop scientific field methods for human exploration. And we do this at an, uh, a uh, lunar analog site at Kilbourne Hole in New Mexico. Um, and what we wanna do is at that site, not only do we want to evaluate the eruptive history of the region, um, but we want to uh, establish some exploration protocols uh, and develop a concept of operations for a variety of our field portable instruments. 
And so I'm going to focus on a couple of those field portable instruments today. Um, the two that I'll be uh, kind of mainly talking about are our geochemical analyzers. Hey, uh, we use so sorry yes. to interrupt. I don't think your slides are advancing for everybody. Oh, no, that's not great. All right. I mean, it was stuck in just the regular slide view, not presentation mode. So I'm not sure if um, that was just me or everyone had that issue. All right. Well, let's try this again. <laughs> Apologies for that. Oh, no worries. I think just the resharing it should fix it. All right. Are they? Uh, uh, yeah. And, and, and if what happened to me happened to everybody, maybe you start one slide back. Um, um, you know what? I'm having a hard time seeing uh, what I'm advancing, so I'm just going to keep this in uh, uh, PowerPoint mode. And apologies for that uh, for everyone. Sherry, at the moment, all we see is you. We don't see you. Okay. <laughs> all right. I'm going to keep this here and so sorry for that. And I hope everyone is able to uh, see this. Yes, we see real time data processing. All right. Well, there we go. Okay. So um, I'm going to keep going and probably jump through quickly here. So I'll be talking about two of our main geochemical analyzers. So we have a LIBS, which is a laser-induced breakdown spectrometer and an XRF. And both of these uh, instruments are able to give us uh, field data. They can record metadata in terms of GPS, uh, acquisition date and time, and a sample number. Um, but what we see on the screen is something uh, that's in terms of our element percent. And as geologists, sometimes it's not always super useful because we don't tend to think of things in terms of an element percent. Um, and a lot of times we wanna um, you know, think about things in terms of an oxide weight percent or look at some of these data products in the context of other things uh, that we've analyzed in the field. And so what we wanna do is um, try and uh, integrate some real-time data processing and the way we want to do this is by uh, transferring our data either via Bluetooth or a wireless hotspot uh, in the field to a lab, a, lab, uh, a tablet or a, a laptop. And um, when we do this, we can then kind of conduct some of our um, processing and be able to look at uh, these products uh, in a more useful way. And the way we want to do this is by um, either creating different tables or different types of um, snapshot images to help us understand uh, the types of uh, rocks or samples that we're looking at and also how they relate uh, in context to um, other things uh, that we've measured in our region. So we've split these into two different types of products. We have our summary data products. This can be as simple as a table of our major oxides or trace elements, or we can uh, choose different types of classic classification diagrams depending on what types or sites that we're investigating. Um, and then we have different types of comparison data products. So after we've acquired one uh, or more samples, now we have the opportunity to uh, compare different types of rocks or different types of uh, sediments to one another and place these in the context of a broader uh, example or uh, site. And so these can help us in terms of tactical decision making. Um, and so we want products that are quick and easy to understand if we want uh, to use these tactically. Um, but then we can have more complicated or um, advanced statistical analyses uh, if we want to utilize these in terms of a science support team or um, later in strategic planning. And so I'll walk through a quick um, kind of example of how this might be used in the field. This is just a Google Earth uh, screenshot of our our uh, field site at Kilbourn Hole. Um, and so one way that we can think about doing this is at stop one, we uh, you know, tell um, our processing methods to, to kind of return one of our summary data products. Let's say as we've walked down this area and now we kind of have some vertical context, um, we can now generate um, some of those uh, contextual products. So how 
uh, do these samples compare with others in the field? And um, if we want to look at it in terms of a stratigraphic column, what is the geochemistry um, changing in terms of our vertical stratigraphy here? And then as we add more and more points to this, we can get a little more um, uh, advanced in our statistical methods, maybe some PCA analyses or uh, plotting several um, of our points on, on top of um, our um, classification diagrams. And that just helps us understand the broader context of the region. Um, so I think I'm almost out of time here, so I'll wrap up quickly. Uh, we're planning a, a field um, excursion in the fall, and this is where we want to, to test whether these data products are actually useful for us in the field, and if not, um, how can they be more useful and how can we modify things in the future? Uh, we want to know, can we quickly transfer data? Um, and if not, how do we improve that? You know, can these products be used by a broader science team? And what do we do to make them more useful to be integrated into overall uh, discussions about the reason uh, of the region? And then how can we integrate these into um, software? So we have some temporal-based software that Ben Feist is talking about later, um, some visu visualization software in the field um, that Zach will talk about right after me. Um, and then, you know, how, how do we make sure that these are archived in ways that uh, the broader public can use them? And so all of these will be useful as we um, jump into a spring expedition where we're actually simulating um, some EVA operations. And, uh, making sure that we can uh, have useful science in the field um, and use these tactically and strategically. With that, I will wrap up. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Sherry. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, so let me ask one question. We still have a, a moment for one question. Um, what you reported analyses of the salt. Um, was that in um, one of the, the salt flows in the vicinity of Kilburn Hole, or were those class within the tough ring and MAR deposits, or was that the matrix, the ashy matrix of the MAR? That's a great question. Um, so I have yet to visit Kilbourne Hole. Um, and so these were just examples um, of basically some example data points. So um, that's not representative uh, exactly of the region, but you know, as we go out there, it'll be populated with real data. Um, these were just meant to just show what, what could be possible. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go ahead and then uh, move on. Uh, so the next presentation is going to be uh, provided by Zachary Morse. And, and Zachary, I apologize if there are multiple co-authors. I've, I've dropped your abstract, um, but I see you're going to be speaking about augmented reality visualization of geologic data collected with portable field instruments. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you, and I am. Let's see if I, uh, hopefully you can see and hear me all right. And yes. I'll share my screen quickly. Um, share. So with any luck, you are seeing my presentation. Um, and yes, uh, just in case, so uh, my name is Zach Morse, uh, this is uh, going to be a chat about some work um, I've been doing with uh, integrating data from portable instruments similar to what Shree just talked about um, into uh, a, a new and interesting way to view that data in the field. Um, my co-authors are listed here. I'm actually a, a postdoc with Howard University uh, working uh, with the RISE-2 group at NASA Goddard. Um, and this is sort of an, an interesting story to tell because this is not, the work I'm talking about is not what I was brought on to do. Mostly uh, I was meant to um, help out with field work, going to Kilburn Hole like Sheree just talked about, um, but that all got put on hold uh, due to the pandemic. So this is a, an interesting, uh, I wouldn't say makeshift, but work that we that we did in the in the interim, uh, sort of being a little creative with, with the time we had. Um, and so it's also an interesting um, uh, method to describe, it's complex to describe, but very easy to show if, if I was able to, to show this, this application in person. So I'll, I'll do my best. Um, but that begins with a description of what we do as field geologists in the field, which I'm sure most of you already know. Um, you, uh, you have your field geologist and you head to a real world outcrop, be that Kilbourne Hole or any of the other field sites we've heard about today. Uh, and you usually have some data and that can be uh, compositional data, numbers, graphs. It can be field notes from folks who have been there before. It can be remote sensing data or geologic maps. 
And more likely, usually it's a combination of all of these things and more. And it's the responsibility of the field geologist to analyze these data and then interpret the surroundings around them and figure out how each of these pieces fits into the real world scene in front of them. And so looking ahead to future field work with, with us and potentially analog missions with, with astronauts or real astronauts someday, we wanna save as much time as we can in that uh, mental interpretation stage. So what this project is doing is trying to compress all of that into uh, one, essentially a tablet or a smartphone view of all the data in real time sort of like uh, a, almost like a geographic information system for rock outcrop. And one thing that this, oh, there it is, AR data visualization. Uh, so one thing that this, this has advantage over uh, a traditional GIS is it, with a traditional GIS, you're looking at a map view. If you're moving around a field site, in this case, Kilbourne Hole, at different locations, you can put a point on the map and it all shows up very well. Um, but if you're in a situation such as this, uh, where you're doing a vertical transect of multiple layers, adding those points to a map gets to be confusing. It can be a cluster of points right on top of one another. But what this application we're developing does is it, it takes that same sort of GIS view where you can sort through different data types and interact with the data and applies it to a vertical surface uh, in real time in front of you. So each of these field flags becomes a digital point and each of those points is linked to the data that was collected there. Uh, and as a benefit, that, the, that link remains as long as the outcrop is in existence. You could return to this field site in a week or a month or a year or two, and the data would still be linked there without having to leave a field flag or a field marker in place. So how does this all work? It's again, it's, it's a bit tricky to explain, but if we go back to our example with the field geologist with an iPad, um, the, essentially the iPad acts as both a screen to view data and a camera to view the world. And so uh, you act, the application activates the camera and the camera begins looking around and we program in what we call digital image target, which is essentially just a digital image of a real world outcrop or a collection of pixels that the pet camera can match uh, to what it's seeing in the real world. And as soon as those pixels match, the application automatically overlays data that we've put into it that has been previously collected this outcrop and overlays that data on the screen in real time. Uh, and so what this looks like in reality, I have a quick video, hopefully this will play, um, is something like this where you have, and this is just a, an example of uh, a uh, retaining wall in my backyard since we couldn't do field work during the pandemic. Again, this is, this is sort of makeshift, do as much as we can with what we could. Um, so you'll see, you can move around different perspectives. The data stays in place. If you get too close, it loses tracking on the image. So the data disappears, um, but then you step back and it sees enough pixels. It knows where to place the data. And you can see um, in this case, an image overlay of, of the wall itself. Um, but we can work with uh, individual data points or images uh, to overlay the data. Um, so back to the title of this program, Overlaying Data from Handheld Instruments, around April, we were starting to be able to get, at least get back to uh, Center at Goddard. And I was responsible for um, working with a new uh, instrument that we have to take on field excursions, TerraSpec Halo. It's a portable field spectrometer. It can uh, record data in visible and near-infrared wavelengths. And it gives you real-time data analysis. Within seconds, you can see a spectrum on the screen of the rock that you are scanning. Uh, and so I thought this would be a good opportunity to go from a, a false uh, outcrop in my backyard and false data to a real outcrop in the real world with real data and try and integrate that together. So the first step uh, is getting the instrument. Next, I needed an outcrop. So I found this uh, rock outcrop nearby my home. It's actually right on the Appalachian Trail near Harpers Ferry, West Virginia. It's um, actually a metamorphosed sandstone, part of the Harper Group. Uh, so it's not the most geologically interesting rock, at least in terms of planetary science. But uh, I guess, as they say, any port in a storm or any rock outcrop in the middle of a pandemic will do. Uh, so we we'll proceeded to do what I think is probably the first field work that has been done at Goddard since uh, everything shut down but last uh, March. Uh, use the spectrometer to take points across the rock. And as you'll see in this close-up image, there are visible variations. You have tan sections, you have red sections. Uh, so a first order hypothesis here is, is are the spectra for these locations the same? Are they different? What can we learn really quickly and then integrate that data into augmented reality? Um, so in, in PowerPoint, this is very easy. You can draw an arrow, you can put the spectrum right on the screen. Uh, and so for the presentation, you all can see this, but the, the trick is to do this in real time for field geologists in the field. Um, so what we do is we take, again, the digital image target, each point I had to record not only the data, but the point where that data was collected from, uh, link those to the spectra that, uh, that are saved, that were exported from the instrument, and then integrate it into a video uh, for you all to show, to show, show everyone. So in, um, hopefully it will not get stuck. Um, see if I can get it to replay. 
Oh, this is, this is the big crux of the presentation. Well, I will advance it as best we can. Um, so what you'll see here is there's actually a few uh, sun flares at the beginning. So hopefully I can actually skip over that. Um, I'm not sure why it is not automatically playing. But what this does is it overlays um, individual points, which remain in place on the outcrop, even as you change perspective. Six minutes. Um, perfect, uh, right on time. Here we go. And, and it started to play. Um, so you'll see these points remain in place. These each represent a spot where I took a spectrum uh, from the outcrop and you can get really close up. Uh, in, in the field, you would actually be holding an iPad with this data on it. But in order to show this, I've just recorded the screen directly from, from my laptop. Um, and if you click on any of these points, the spectrum is now, now shows up. So it's linked to the exact point on the rock uh, where it was taken. And anyone with the tablet with this app on it can view these spectrum. So it takes that data from being sort of bottlenecked either from the, spec, uh, from the spectrometer itself or from a laptop and uh, makes it available for multiple members of a field party to view and uh, analyze. And as you might've seen really quickly, it was sort of a quick video test here, but um, despite the visual differences in the rock, the spectrum are all, a spectra are all very similar, so uh, similar composition. Uh, there's, a, there's a control panel at the bottom so you can turn on and off different points and look right at the rock itself. Um, but yeah, this, this takes the data and applies it right in front of you um, for everyone to view and uh, interpret. So uh, next steps with this, obviously we would next wanna integrate data from multiple instrument sources. This was just a first step, um, but you can imagine a full field deployment with multiple instruments going. You could uh, have that all linked and so different teams can, can view and understand different sources of data all right at the outcrop face. Um, hopefully uh, moving on to, right now we use just the static image target, but hopefully in the future we'll be able to take 3D scans of the outcrops and then link the data to a 3D model, which will help with some of the jittering or stuttering you may have seen. Um, that was also partly due to trying to record this at the same time as using the app, so I apologize for that. Um, but uh, hopefully also in the future, integrating uh, this into a HoloLens for your sort of heads up display or hands-free visualization of data in the field, maybe integrating it into an analog mission scenario. And finally, more field work. And uh, more importantly, getting it into the hands of field geologists to get input, feedback, and improve the user experience so that this can actually become a tool that we use on a regular basis in the field. And so with that, I think I'm practically out of time. So I will end here with a quick, very quick example that just says, thank you. And if there are any questions, uh, I'll take those. So thanks. Okay, Zach, thank you. We have a minute and a half left in your time. Let, let, there's, I'm the only one who asks a question for you. So let me uh, uh, go ahead and, and consume that time. In, in a field exercise at Meteor Crater, uh, we had a test subject that was so focused on the task of taking pictures of a boulder for kind of producing the type of product that you just described, he didn't make observations of the rock himself. And, mm -hmm. the, and his observations of the rock itself would have changed the traverse if he had been paying attention to making his own observations. And so in that case, the data collection interfered with traverse productivity. And I'm wondering if you've encountered the same phenomenon and if so, have you found a way to mitigate the problem? So it's, it's a good thing to, to know about. We actually, since all of this work has been done since the pandemic started, I haven't had a chance to deploy this at a real field excursion. Um, and so I, I would say that the way that hopefully this will be mitigated is that this, this application works um, by integrating mostly data from a previous field uh, excursion. So be that field photos, notes, uh, spectra that were previously collected and then can be compiled in a database so that on your second trip or the next day you go out, you have easy access to pre-recorded data. So in that case, you're not necessarily focused on collecting data for the app. You are just focused on collecting data as a field geologist that you might want for future research or for future notes. And then we take that and we kind of uh, collect all of it uh, and integrate it together to provide just a new way to visualize the data. So hopefully my hope is that this will become um, a useful tool for reference rather than uh, collection in real time. Um, but any data that is collected that has a visible component could be integrated into this for future visualization. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so I'm going to pass the gavel, if you will, back to Sherry, who is going to uh, lead off the uh, lightning round. All right, great. Uh, so we have several lightning talks um, and each person has two minutes uh, for this round. So what I'll do is at the 30 second mark, I'll just pop my video back on uh, so you know um, that you have a couple seconds to wrap it back up. 
Um, so we'll kick off with our first talk from Michael Walker. And the title of uh, his talk is Mixed Reality Cyber Physical Virtual Control Rooms for Lunar Robot uh, Teleoperation and Supervision. Okay. Hey, can you hear me? All right. Yes, we can. Okay, great. Here, let me just share my screen here and I'll get started. All right. So hello everyone, my name is Michael Walker and I'm a fifth year PhD student at the University of Colorado Boulder, working with Jack Burns' Nest Team. The poster I'm presenting today focuses on a method of using augmented virtuality to improve robot teleoperation and supervision. Virtual and mixed reality interfaces have shown great promise for enhancing interactions with robots. Unlike 2D screens, virtual and mixed reality displays support video and data presentation in 3D, unparalleled telepresence, and enhanced immersion. Early methods of incorporating virtual reality with robotic interfaces have seen the use of mounted stereo cameras that live stream a dual video feed to a virtual reality head mounted display. Unfortunately, this naive robot egocentric method has serious drawbacks, including intense cyber sickness from contradictory proprioceptive system cues, the lack of modern 3D reconstruction techniques to enhance situational awareness of the robot's remote environment, as well as the isolating nature of such interfaces that restrict users' awareness to that of a robot's camera, which fully envelop the user's field of view. With these limitations in mind, the CU Nest team is proposing a design that incorporates virtual control rooms and cyber physical interfaces into a single unified system where robot teleoperators can work within a virtual space to supervise and control remote robots on the lunar surface and navigation and assembly missions. In our interface, 3D environment reconstructions and 3D video streams are combined into a single interface. This augmented virtuality design provides both egocentric first person and exocentric third person perspectives of the robot's remote environment to capture the best of both worlds in interface design to enhance robot teleoperator capabilities. Additionally, our interface provides a collaborative virtual environment that would allow scientists from around the globe, on the moon, and within the gateway to plan and operate rovers on the lunar surface, such as how JPL operates Perseverance in an in-person control room. If you'd like to hear more about our mixed reality interface design, please come to uh, see me at Poster 8 in the upcoming poster session, and thank you for having me. Wow, that was perfectly on time. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> no, um, no, thank you. And some really cool stuff. Uh, that's awesome. So our next lightning talk will be from Tara Sweeney. And uh, Tara will be talking about documenting planetary surface operations using automatic imaging platforms and 3D image processing. Good morning, Shariq. Are you able to hear me? Yes, we can. Outstanding and able to see my screen. Looks great. Fantastic. Well, hello, I'm Tara Sweeney, and I'm excited to be representing our research group under the advising of Dr. Jose Hurtado out here at the University of Texas at El Paso, Go Miners. Uh, yes, today I get to have the opportunity to present our work on how we would like to collect and document planetary surface operations. Specifically, we'll be sharing with you our unique approach to capturing both high resolution still and video imagery, both from the first and third person perspectives. And then we'll transition into a discussion about um, how we plan to use modern data processing methods to actually synthesize all of that data that we want to uh, collect into data products and training products that uh, will be able to be uh, uniquely and uh, of great interest to both the lunar scientists and lunar mission support personnel that will be fielding all these operations. So I am going to be located over at the astronauts and analog session in room 10. I hope you'll come on over and help create a wicked awesome conversation about how we're gonna document, document all of the work that we're gonna do on the lunar surface together. Thanks so much. Awesome, thank you so much, Tara. That was great. Um, so our next uh, talk we have is uh, titled The Effects of a Cooling Garment on Exercise Performance and Perceived Exertion, a Preliminary Report. And this will be given by Christopher Pro. Hi there, my name is Christopher Pro from the University of Central Florida. And this is a proof of concept and baseline study looking at the effect of a cooling garment on exercise performance. 
In the background for this study is that as new materials and polymer polymers are worked into future spacesuit de designs to mitigate radiation, including other substances like water, it can increase the thermal stress placed on astronauts. And using cooling uh, interventions can help mitigate that thermal stress. So for this study, we had participants come in and complete a 10K time trial on the bike in one condition they had a cooling vest on and the other they didn't. And we measured neuromuscular, neuro, uh, metabolic performance and cognitive data during those sessions. And based on the preliminary results of the metabolic and performance data, there is no real effect on exercise from the cooling vest. We're still working on the neuromuscular and cognitive data. But what this tells us is at the very least that using a cooling garment has no negative effect on exercise. But as, if thermal stress becomes more of an issue, then using techniques like increasing the amount of surface area that's in contact with the coolant or finding a coolant that can increase the temperature gradient between the coolant and the skin can be effective at mitigating heat stress during EV activities. Really cool work, Christopher. Looking forward to, to stopping by your poster today. All right, we'll uh, move right along. So next we have Gregory Smith. And Gregory will be uh, discussing the analysis of neuropulmonary access uh, following lunar regolith uh, simul simulant exposure. All right, thank you so much. Let me share my screen. Okay, can you see this okay? okay so yes, that looks great. Okay, so my name is Greg. I'm a first year master's student at Stony Brook University Department of Pharmacological Sciences. Um, so the, the background and motivating force for the study was kind of to assess the toxicity effects of lunar dust to human health. So during the Apollo 17 mission, people came back, reported a fever, reportedly smelled like gun smoke. Um, Apollo 17 uh, astronaut Jack Schmidt reported having his nose uh, like inflamed swollen after the exposure. So we were kind of looking to see what type of effects this can have on health. So the experiments overview, how does the lunar dust simulants affect health? Is it associated with disease? To answer this question, um, I took lunar dust simulant, the lunar Mars simulant, introduced it into mouse airways and compared it with saline and titanium dioxide controls, then took out brain and lung tissue and had them assessed for any pathological changes. So. This is what lung slides look like underneath the microscope. So all these little airs, these little like sacs, these are your alveoli. Um, and here we have uh, an A is just saline treated. And then we can see these refractile crystals visualized under dark field microscopy. And in C, we could actually see some of the dust actually being engulfed by immune cells. So the dust was definitely in the airway. And from the, from the mice with these dust in the airway, we were able to take, take out the brain. So in neurological tissue, um, the brain's immune cell is called the microglia. So it becomes activated in disease and inflamed. So top row, we have saline treated. And we can see the blue is just the cell nuclei. The green are the microglia at a resting state. Treating with lunar Mars simulant, the microglia become branched, activated, appear to increase the number, inflamed. And with titanium dioxide or anatase, it's the similar uh, effect. Um, there has been one study reporting that titanium dioxide exposure is toxic to the central nervous system. So there appears to be morphological changes in the brain's immune cell following lunar Mars simulant exposure that is associated with neuroinflammation. I'd like to acknowledge the Circa Lab, the McLean Lab, the Glotch Lab, um, and the RISE-2 grant, and the uh, survey community. Thank you, Gregory. What a cool different take on what we've been <laughs> uh, discussing today. That's really awesome. Yeah, thank you. All right. Uh, <laughs> Great, so uh, next we have uh, Phaedra Curlin and she'll be giving um, a quick talk about the construction of lunar infrastructure, leveraging low latency VR, AR uh, teleoperation. Hello, um, my name is Phaedra Curlin and I'm here with Mason Bell and Madeline Moniz from the University of Colorado Boulder. And we are presenting our lab's work to support the construction of lunar infrastructure, leveraging low latency VR and AR teleoperation. We are motivated by NASA's goals for sustained lunar presence through the creation of the Lunar Gateway and the deployment of various lunar surface assets. Our work directly aims to support Farside, a concept mission involving collaboration between humans and robots to construct a low frequency radio array on the lunar Farside. With the development of low latency control, 
we are investigating the methods of human-robot interaction that would enhance this collaboration. We have specifically focused on autonomous failure where the robot requests for teleoperative support. We propose a risk-free virtual sandbox representative of the robot's current state and environment, which is then used as a platform for solution development. This method aims to create a real-time failure response as opposed to more traditional methods, such as the Mars Yard's physical hardware duplicates used to replicate rover failures on Earth. In this virtual space, the user is able to interact with the same control interface and software as the one present on the actual robot. The user has the ability to switch between the egocentric view, replicating telepresence, and exocentric view, which is a third-person perspective that would leverage 3D scans of the environment made by the robot. The experiment itself will consist of an antenna realignment task. To prove the effectiveness of the virtual sandbox, our experiment will have half of our participants use the virtual simulation at the failure before taking control of the physical rover, and the other half will attempt to recover the physical rover without the use of the simulation. We are excited to see if a virtual simulation can provide the information needed for teleoperators and hope that will open many doors uh, for other remote operator experiences during the deployment of lunar infrastructure. Thank you. Great job, Phaedra. Thank you so much for that. And that brings us to the last talk of our lightning session. Uh, and this is titled Hybrid Dust Mitigation uh, Brush Utilizing EDS and UV Technologies. And this is from Christopher Solon. Sorry, Christopher. <laughs> no worries. <clears throat> um, let me try to get this up properly. Um, there we go. Uh, can you see my slide? Yes, looks great. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, my name is Christopher Scholand. Um, I am a student at Georgia Tech, and uh, I'm presenting on a project I've been working on for about a year now, um, that is the hybrid dust mitigation brush utilizing EDS and UV technologies. Um, this is part of NASA's big idea challenge for 2021, and we have a student team that's working on it right now that is comprised of graduate and undergraduate students, as well as being advised by uh, Dr. Sebrews, Dr. Scheibel, Dr. Orlando, Dr. Leitze, and our chief advisor is Dr. Lindsay. Um, if you want to see our poster later, it's in the Dust Mitigation and Astronaut Health uh, group, and it is poster number seven. So again, as I mentioned, um, this is part of NASA's Big Idea Challenge. Uh, this year, the focus is on dust mitigation, and they have uh, many different areas that they're looking at. And our team uh, proposed a solution to the problem of dust getting all over astronaut spacesuits. Um, we wanted to develop a handheld tool that would be very easy for astronauts to use. Um, so you can see uh, an early prototype of that um, on the slide there. It is a brush that we're going to try to enhance with EDS or electrodynamic dust shielding technology. Um, in doing this, we wish to enhance the base uh, functions of a brush and get EDS into a form that hasn't been done before. It's normally on a two-dimensional plane. We're trying to get it into a volume within the bristles. And we're hoping that in making this tool, we'll be able to make something that astronauts can use to um, not only clean their own spacesuits in an easy uh, manner, but also clean um, any other technology, whether that's from the Apollo missions or from the Artemis missions. Um, currently, we are going through an experimental phase as we're trying to get some of these technologies working. Um, the overall project uh, will be just under a year as we started um, with our proposal in December. I mean, have been working as one of the seven finalist teams since January. Um, so we are very excited to be working on this, and we will be uh, presenting more of our work at the Ascendant Conference in uh, November of this year. Um, so again, if you wish to see more about uh, this presentation, please check uh, out the poster. It's poster seven in the Dust Mitigation and National Health Group. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christopher. Okay, Sheree, we have time for discussion. Um, I think we have about uh, 20 minutes for discussion. Um, you had wanted to touch base again on the ESA NASA astronaut training collaboration. Um, one of the other questions that um, had popped up has been answered also in the chat. Um, let me address maybe the ESA uh, NASA astronaut question first, and then we can go back to the chat window. And so uh, I invite everybody, if you do have a question for any of the speakers, um, please uh, uh, indicate that with a cue and the speaker's names so that we can direct the question appropriately. 
uh, but this is for the all of the uh, speakers today, including our lightning speakers. Okay, let's not forget uh, them. Okay, so uh, to restate what I said in the chat box, uh, Sherry, is that um, uh, I have personally spoken with uh, some of the ESA trainers and some of the ESA astronauts, and they're interested in collaborative training activities, but that type of thing has not yet been approved at the uh, agency level, which is where the decision has to be made. Um, so I think that everybody is on board and interested in making those types of collaborative uh, uh, studies uh, possible, but they've, they've not occurred in the past. And I, and I should explain that um, there historically has been a joint uh, training between NASA, uh, the Canadian Space Agency, CSA, and the Japanese Space Agency, JAXA, for many years. And so I've had CSA and JAXA astronauts in our, our classes at Meteor Crater in the Flagstaff area and, and in the classrooms here in Houston. Um, but uh, ESA has had thus far an, an independent um, uh, training activity. Thanks for answering that question again. <laughs> um, so I have another question that maybe uh, can be addressed by several people. So um, many of our earlier talks talked about uh, the history of preparing for um, Apollo in different sites um, that the astronauts trained at. And so um, based on those sites and maybe some others, um, David and Noah and, and uh, maybe others who are here, are there preferences for maybe um, certain sites that you think are more applicable to uh, where we're planning to go at the Lunar South Pole or are there new sites that you would like to explore as analogs for uh, astronaut training? Um, Sherry, why, why, let me start, but we definitely should hear from Noah and, and Oz, and, and for that matter, anybody uh, can, can uh, chime in here. But um, I, would, I would say that um, we want to be conscious of the fact that the Artemis Exploration Zone, again, is an impact crater terrain. And so there has to be some emphasis on uh, doing training in impact uh, analog uh, terrains or impact crater uh, terrain. Um, and so Meteor Crater, Schooner Crater, Sierra Madera, Reese Crater, Sudbury are all logical places. They're, they're places that Apollo used and they're, they're places that we should uh, again use. Um, that said, you wanna augment that strategically with other sites that introduce crew um, to um, other geologic processes or lithologies. And so um, the South Polar region is also a feldspathic highlands type of region. And so uh, uh, we should be training uh, at the Stillwater complex or the Duluth complex um, or some place uh, like Mistostin as Oz described where anorthosites and anorthositic igneous assemblages uh, are, are um, prevalent. Um, and throughout that process, we have to train not only crew, but we have to train the science ops personnel and management. Everybody needs to get a better handle on field, geolog field geology and field geological principles. Um, in Apollo, everybody involved were either meteoriticists who understood extraterrestrial samples or were truly bona fide field geologists. Today, planetary sciences has very few bona fide field geologists. So we need to train uh, everybody. Uh, Oz, do you have anything to add? <clears throat> yeah, I'm happy to, you know, slightly biased because I'm up here in Canada, but, uh, and I can share, I was trying to dig out a link to an abstract I actually presented at the, the recent USGS analogs workshop that uh, Noah alluded to too. Um, but yeah, you know, there's the bottom line is there's no one single uh, either impact or volcanic analog site that will, you know, do the job. I think, you know, as a, a scaled approach, Media Crater is a fantastic, you know, first crater for astronauts to see because, you know, it's right there in your face and the, the, the geology is impressive. Um, but there's a series of sites that, uh, up here in Canada that are, you know, are definitely a lot more accessible than they were during Apollo. Uh, you know, Subreason uh, is a good example that was visited uh, during the final two Apollo missions. Differentiated impact melt sheet, one of the biggest well-preserved craters we have here on Earth. 
Um, you know, Mistaston is a site we're looking at. I presented on that. And there's also West Clearwater Lake, too, up in northern Quebec, where you have, you know, cliffs and outcrops of impact melt, very dretches, very complicated um, rock types that they'll be encountering in these south polar terrains. And so um, I did put it in the chat, but, you know, there is, I have been working with some of the, uh, the, the trainers um, that I collaborated with during the ASCAN training, and we're looking at, you know, potentially mistasting Clearwater other sites uh, for, for training for Artemis. And, uh, yeah, you know, so I think there's a variety of sites up here. Noah, do you have uh, anything to add before we move on to some other questions? Well, I see Pascal has his hand up, so I might defer to him and, and think about what I'd like to add, but um, I'll let Pascal follow up, and then if I can go after Pascal, that would be fine. Sounds great. Pascal, take it away. Uh, hello, everybody. This will be brief. I just um, agreed with everybody who, who just spoke about the need for a, a range of analogs that will cover the uh, you know, the science diversity that we are wanting to explore on the moon. I just wanted to point out that uh, we should also look at sites that combine that with operational uh, constraints that are relevant as well. So uh, one crater that has not been brought up uh, yet um, is of course Houghton Crater where I've worked qu quite a bit and many others have as well. Uh, there you have not only of course an impact structure but you have terrain that is essentially devoid of vegetation. Houghton is uh, roughly the scale of uh, Shackleton. It's 20 kilometers in diameter. Uh, comms are horizontal because we need to talk to geostationary satellites once we're up there. Uh, and at that latitude, the, the, uh, the comms run into ground effects, which will be essentially plaguing uh, some of the surface comms issues that we have in the polar regions of the moon. Uh, and also there are things like 24 hours of daylight in the summer, uh, Etc. So, and the, incidentally, there are PSRs at Houghton, permanently shadowed regions, technically where you do not see the disk of the sun. So, so they are places where we actually find some some patches of, uh, of permanent ice. Uh, anyway, uh, science science analogs, but if possible, combining them with operational analogs as well would be great. Thanks, Pascal. Uh, no, do you have some more to add on? Yeah, I, I just wanted to follow on. You know, we're talking a lot about the, the, the geology, and that's good. But remember also, the South Pole is going to be an incredibly challenging illumination environment. I turned off the lights in my office. To, you know, again, the sun is going to be coming in at effectively the horizon, as much as seven degrees above the horizon in some places. It's going to be a challenge, and, and we have to train not only for the geology, but just the, the situational awareness of long shadows of glaring sun and the opposition effect. And so we can simulate some of those things in the lab. And so I'd also push towards high polar environment, high terrestrial Arctic environments to, again, try to recreate just the, the sense. And maybe it's only during sunset or those wonderful times when the sun is around the horizon, but those moments where we can again, try to synthesize, hey, this environment is going to be difficult from a lighting condition from having, again, the sun straight in your eyes or long shadows and, and simulating that aspect. And as has been said, you know, no one site will capture all that, but that has to be considered as well as recreating this in a natural environment to go out, not just in a, in a rock yard, but in a, in a geologic environment. Hey, let's now go drill or seed some samples that we want crew to collect because that challenge will also be present. Thanks for all of those answers. And there's a, a related question while everyone's here. Um, and we have a, a question that asks, does water saturation play a part in choosing exploration sites? Is it, maybe I need a follow-up question. Water, like detection of water at a location on the moon of where we're going to go? Um, I guess if, if that's the case, certainly, you know, that, that, you know, the remote sensing data for, for hydration, for water at the, the, the surface of the moon, you know, that's one of the reasons we want to go is to find out what that water is and touch it. So absolutely. That's one of the criteria, uh, from a science standpoint that I, we have to bring to bear when, when picking, picking sites. If I misinterpreted that question, or if there are other interpretations from, from this august panel, please, please correct me, but. 
Now, Great. We'll, saturation we'll is a tricky question. question because we know there's no saturated places on the moon. So if we find that, that'd be pretty cool. <laughs> All right, well, we'll see if there's a follow-up to that uh, later on. Um, uh, maybe we'll kind of change subjects really quick. We have a, a question for Gregory Smith um, from Krista, and she says, great talk. Uh, you see the effects of simulant exposure on microglia, but do you know if there are cognit cognitive effects of exposure to the simulate as well? So Gregory, can you uh, address that question? Hopefully we still have uh, Gregory with us. Not quite sure. <laughs> uh, well, since he's not speaking up, um, Sherry, um, maybe I can ask you and Zach a question. Um, when, when you were doing the test, oh, and I, I realized when your team has been doing the tests at Kilburn Hole, so let me right, bring everybody in. Um, did anybody do um, a, a test of comparing the geology that could be done with, without the instruments versus the geology that was done with the instruments. And, and that is uh, assess um, the pros and cons of the, of the additional uh, load of instruments, kind of, kind of uh, like Oz did uh, with, with one of his exercises. I, that's a great question, David. Um, I know myself, and I believe Zach too, uh, we're not involved in the RISE 4. Uh, expedition to Kilbourne Hole. So we're newbies to this um, and have a lot to learn from our team members. Um, but based on what I've learned, um, a, a lot of what was done in the field um, was kind of either compared to, at least the science was compared to what we could learn back in the lab, um, which was really interesting comparing the field data uh, to the lab data. Um, but I'm not quite sure about, you know, exploring what was done with and without the instruments. Um, Zach, do you have anything to add to that? Uh, well, no, like you said, I, I haven't actually been a part of the RISE 2 deployments yet, thanks to the pandemic, but I, uh, bridging the gap was slightly part of uh, some of the work Oz was doing up in Western Ontario. So we've, we've done a bit of field work with, um, well, especially with analog rovers where you're comparing, um, what humans can do versus just a full, uh, platform of, of our suite of instruments. And it, there's, there's different strategies to mitigate it. The, I think one of the things we said along with those analog deployments was sort of like a walk around or a, 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 a scan of the terrain. So when you put a human in the field, um, you, you do your, your basic observational work where you, we walk around, you take your brief field notes before diving into or identifying sites of interest that you then do additional uh, data collection with handheld instruments. And I think that that, that method uh, is useful for, for sort of combining the, the without instruments, you know, old, old school geology observation with, with all the new techniques we have. Ben, maybe you can uh, answer some of these questions too. Sure, I, I was there. I'm probably the least qualified of all the people who were there to answer the question, but I can tell you how it worked. Um, we did simulate at EVAs uh, and we did simulation of having essentially magical um, geological instruments in that uh, crew would mark a location that was of interest on the EVA and it would take them no time on the clock of the EVA to get the reading because a uh, handler would sort of run over with a handheld instrument and actually hold it there after the crew had moved on. So we did not do any um, testing of uh, the pros and cons of say having to hold a libs on a rock for a minute during an EVA, which would be an eternity. Um, it was more about what was, and we wouldn't get the data from the libs during the EVA. This was all post EVA analysis of just trying to understand what you get afterwards and what kind of picture does that paint of, of where you've been. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Sherry, we have another five minutes. Um, if you wanna revisit the question about uh, water saturation. Sure, so it looks like we have a, a follow-up and it says um, from previous talks, I've been in, there was mention of the possibility of water saturation uh, linked with solar winds and eclipses. So I was interested in seeing if um, that is part of selecting the training sites. Uh, 
So, um, Noah, please go ahead. Thanks, David. No, I, I, so I, let, let me walk this backwards. So you know, we see hydration on the moon. If those are places that we end up wanting to go, which of course we will want to go to places we see water, then it comes down to how do we find an appropriate analog for that on the earth and again, appropriate. It's not gonna capture all of the things. Now, very unlikely will we have crew, uh, you know, putting in a hand pump well to, to get that water out. It's more of working with the regolith, working with the materials that we, we know we can simulate. And so it, it takes that question of, there's a science target that has a feature, a you know hydration feature and say, okay, how do we, get to a place on the earth that gives us the best opportunity for, for astronauts to, to understand what it's like as best we can simulate in that environment on the earth. And so we don't have to recreate the water on the moon on the earth. We have to recreate the environment, working with the equipment, drilling in or, or, or putting in a drill, <clears throat> excuse me. And so I, I, I think it's an important distinction between finding an analog that tells you this is exactly what the moon is like. We won't have that, but this is the approximation of it that will give an astronaut and the folks working with astronauts, whether it's science background support, Capcoms, everyone else in mission control, an opportunity to say, ah, these are the challenges that we'll have working in that environment. What happens when a drill bit gets stuck? What happens when the regolith is more compacted than, than we want? I'm gonna now let you clean up my mess here, David, but I think that's the essence of what you're getting at is finding the place that represents the environment and the, the type of thing, not necessarily going out and, and drilling into water because we don't, we're not going to have water on the moon. We're going to have a special sample that we'll want to collect. How do we recreate that on the earth? <clears throat> yeah, no, I, I would say that that is a perfect um, uh, answer. What I would, what I'd only do is, is expand upon that is maybe better explain the sources of the origin, given the nature of this question. Um, so let me just stipulate that um, over geologic time, volatiles to the lunar polar regions were delivered by impact cratering events, uh, by volcanism, uh, by uh, solar wind uh, leaking from the crust. All of those are mechanisms that delivered volatiles, we think, to the polar regions. So, and one of the, the, the end games here is to locate um, sites where we can recover those resources for a sustainable lunar program. And that will involve not only um, studying sites where the volatiles may be most abundant, but studying sites where the nature of the volatiles, their distribution and their compositions may differ so that we can better understand the transport and depositional processes, which will give us a much better global ISRU uh, perspective. Um, so th that's kind of the backdrop. Uh, and what you said about analog training sites is exactly right. Great, thank you both. And I think our uh, question asker is very satisfied with that and, and thanks you uh, for your answers and clarification. Um, David, I didn't see any more questions in the chat. Did I miss any that you picked up? Well, J Jacob uh, Richardson has uh, made a comment that people may want to uh, pay attention to. And I, th I think Ben Feiss's hand may be up again. So maybe Ben has something more to say? No, oh, sorry, I just left it up because I'm not good at this. <laughs> okay, uh, well, Sherry, um, I think that our time is just about over um, by I think it is too. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here and for joining us in our session. Uh, I think it was great to see all the presentations. Please check out the posters. Uh, there's a variety of um, topics to be discussed and they all looked and sounded very interesting to me. So um, be sure to visit that in Gather Town. Um, and I think with that, it uh, wraps up our, our session today. So thank you to all of our speakers.
Recording stopped.
to jump on in here. So I'll open with just a few probably becoming familiar useful pieces of information. Uh, first of all, hi, my name is Kayla Berry and I, I am based in the Solar System Exploration Division at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. And I'll be one of your co-chairs today, along with Elise Rumpf at USGS. And we are so glad that you have been able to join us. So thank you for being here. Hi, Elise. So a few things to keep in mind as we get started. Uh, as you know, the talks will be eight minutes long and we will have two minutes for questions immediately following each talk. We will also have additional time for discussion after all of the talks are completed. We will ask everyone to please keep mics and videos off unless called on by at least or myself and to utilize the chat to ask questions of presenters. Please do go ahead and include the Q in brackets and the presenter's name when you ask a question so that we can wrap it correctly. Uh, of course, everyone is asked to keep discussion inclusive and constructive in accordance with the code of conduct and to respect everyone's intellectual property rights by not sharing the screenshots of anyone's work without their permission. Uh, lastly, if the chat window is distracting, please feel free to go ahead and close it. We will read out key information and announcements as well. And with that, I will transition to our first speaker, who will be Ernie Bell, uh, presenting a talk titled Terrestrial Lunar Analogs, Field Geophysics Lessons for Lunar Service Science Operations. And Ernie, I'll give you some verbal warnings when your time is at the six and eight minute mark. Go ahead, thank you. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and get screen shared. So if I could just get a confirmation, everyone can see that. We can. Thanks. Okay, excellent. So, um, Uh, okay. See. Sorry, just moving the video out of the way. Um, so afternoon, everyone. Uh, good to uh, be here and talk with everyone. Just want to recognize that this uh, work is actually uh, not just with uh, myself and the University of Maryland. Um, it's also uh, work um, from NASA, folks at NASA Goddard, Goddard uh, Northern Arizona University, and uh, uh, all listed there at the bottom. Um, so I'll make sure you recognize everyone. So what we're looking at is uh, using geophysics um, in terrestrial lunar analogs and looking at it from a lunar surface science operational standpoint. So um, to start, um, back in Apollo, the geophysical ta task types were essentially could be uh, grouped into two different types of tasks. This would be um, deployments, which are one uh, instruments that are put out and left. They are you know, set up one time, things such as the Apollo 12 lunar surface experiment package, which had a multitude of various types of instruments that were deployed. Um, it included also the heat flow probes, um, also active seismic um, lines, such as the geophone line from Apollo 16. So that was one type of set of um, uh, tasks that were performed, geophysical tasks. The other could be grouped in a traverse type task where you took a reading at one point and then the crew would traverse to another point and take another reading. And this would either be on foot or uh, via the uh, lunar rover. And this could be things such as uh, magnetometry, which you see on the left of the screen there, a magnetometer, which was deployed, readings taken, and then uh, moved on to the next uh, location. Uh, gravimetry, such as the Apollo 17 crew member there in the middle, or even uh, the lunar seismic profiling experiment of Apollo 17, where even though the geophones were set near the LEM itself, the um, explosive packages were actually deployed throughout the lunar rover traverse. So it's kind of a combination of the two actually, but the traverse was required in order to get to proper distances for the explosive packages. So um, we've performed uh, a number of geophysical uh, studies in terrestrial analogs and the two field sites that uh, specifically have looked at are the San Francisco volcanic field, specifically around the SP crater, which is just north of Flagstaff. And um, it's, it's a, volcanic field of a number of cinder cones. You can see a picture of it there in the lower left. And in the other location um, is Lava Beds National Monument, which is in Northern California and is a huge um, lava flow, multiple lava flows, cinder cones, and particularly has a wide range of lava tubes there, which we've done, or specifically I've been working on uh, magnetometry and um, surveys and things like that there. In the San Francisco volcanic field, it was uh, seismic surveys. 
So in San Francisco volcanic field, we've done um, two different types of seismic surveys. Uh, one's kind of short geophone lines, about 115 meters. Other are longer uh, nodal lines of a kilometer in length. This is active seismic refraction. You can see some of the examples of the analysis here in the upper left is 1D refraction analysis. And below it is actually some 2D refraction analysis that we've done. Now the 1D was on the geophone lines and the 2D is on the one kilometer long nodal lines. And in the Lava Beds National Monument, I've been performing uh, a number of surface um, area surveys, magnetic surveys over top of the lava tubes for a couple of years. And uh, you can see in the upper right, this is some of the resulting um, magnetic highs and lows, the lows being cool colors, the highs being more the, uh, the brighter colors that you see actually um, plotted over top of some of the, uh, a map of the actual, um, a topography of the actual uh, lava tube itself. And in the lower right, you see some results of um, some 3D modeling that was done using LIDAR. Um, some of the team members were doing that. And then how this results into observed. And then we were able to actually then model these anomalies that would be produced by the lava tubes themselves. So we were able to compare that. But I want to talk about how we would actually then use what we've learned in these um, geophysical field studies to now um, extend it to potentially the moon. And one of the first um, talk about some of the strategies that we would use. So you'd want to look at, first of all, what type of deployment was it going to be? Is this going to be a permanent or long-term type of installation, such as a seismometer, and you see examples on the moon and actually out in San Francisco volcanic field? Or is this more of a transitory type of use of instrumentation, such as magnetometry, where you have a magnetometer in the lower, lower left on the moon and then in the lower right that we used in uh, lava beds and moved it across an area? Oops, and yeah, some things there. So then you look at from a mode standpoint, is this gonna be a single point? Is this gonna be a transect? In other words, a line, or are we covering an area? So what type of mode do we actually wanna perform the geophysical uh, study in? And this is to be expanded to any type of particular, any type of geophysical study, not one particular study, but what type of mode would we wanna use? So a single point, a line, or over an area, essentially. And then the next step would be to determine what type of method. So we have, you know, how we're going to deploy, how long we're going to deploy the instrument, what type of survey needs to be done essentially. And then we want to know how do we want to do it. We want to do it just purely with the crew, which is A, and I'm using representations from sub uh, C uh, research and operations that are done um, routinely out in the oceans. So is it just a crew member that's executing it manually? Or B, do you have a robotically augmented crew ops, such as in this case, this is the Alvin submersible, where the crew is there, but they're using robotic arms and things like to actually do the work outside. So they're assisted um, robotically. And there's Can ways to translate that. I'm sorry? Two more minutes. Oh, okay, great. So there's ways to translate that to a geophysical um, surveys on the earth and the moon. Or do you actually have a crew assisted robotic op where the crew sets up the robot, and sends it off on its way, but they're there just for rescue or resupply, essentially a reconditioning of the robot, or is it telerobotically commanded type of operations? So let's, we also learned uh, several lessons from uh, the analogs that we've used. So from a planning standpoint, you wanna know what the data density and what the aperture of the type of, for the type of geophysical study you wanna do. You wanna determine what type of deployment, mode, or method you wanna use. And then these all get fed into training for lunar operations. So you can use terrestrial lunar analogs to provide the reality of this uh, field work in a training. And then for execution, what type of coordination needs to take place? Coordination of you know, the instrument placement, placement between the crew and the ground here on Earth. What type of data evaluation needs to be taken place real time? And what type of operational lessons can we learn as far as, or provide as far as functionality verification? If there is an issue, what kind of support from the ground can we provide to the crew? So in conclusion, three main takeaways here would be, first of all, use the terrestrial analogs um, to, to evolve the Apollo era science operational strategies to include our modern technology to provide additional capabilities essentially. And then use a matrix of deployment strategies, modes and methods to op optimize what type of lunar surface science tasks and how they should be performed within the overall mission architecture. So you can optimize that um, based on those three types of things. And then integrate this into the task development from the beginning so that you're, it's included in the mission planning, training, and execution phases um, and using the terrestrial analogs to do this. 
So in conclusion, that's, uh, that's my talk. I uh, appreciate you listening. Thank you so much, Ernie. And uh, that was eight minutes on the dot. Appreciate you. I haven't seen anything come through the chat so far. But are there any questions for Ernie at this time? Hearing none yet. Uh, we'll jump in with one. Ernie, you uh, brought us some lessons learned and uh, hinted at some of the, the next generation work that's uh, going to come out of this research. What are some of the things that you're most excited about seeing come into play in future lunar exploration based on this work? I'm sorry, you came through just a little bit broken there. Can you please repeat the question for me? Sure thing. Yes, you. Uh, Told us a little bit of, about some of the lessons that are being learned from this work and um, that it will play into next generation technology as that applies to lunar exploration. But what are some of the outcomes that you're really excited about seeing come to fruition here based on your research? Okay, well, I, I think we can get uh, more extensive coverage. Um, you know, we had, Apollo was fantastic because it had. Um, you know, initial evaluation of the moon from a geophysical perspective, really. But now we can start looking at more of the details and optimizing the mission, especially with the longer missions. We can look at um, and potentially traverses. Um, how do we get true area surveys, potentially? Can we integrate the robotics? Robotics have really advanced a lot now, but they haven't necessarily advanced enough to stay parallel maybe with the humans. But there's a good uh, synergy, I think, that we can have between robotic operations and crude operations of the task, you know. And then we can use you know, the, the work that we're doing in the terrestrial analogs to understand, okay, this might be a fairly crew intensive task if we have the crew do it, but it's gonna be for a short duration. So that's a good trade-off versus maybe the more monotonous repetitive type tasks that we could delegate to robotic operations and have the crew there to uh, fill in. But one of the things I think could be really interesting is that you know, we've been doing robotic operations on Mars for a while but the pace of it, I think the pace could be increased if you have humans on site to essentially provide, I want to say, a rescue capability to the robotic surveyor, maybe, if um, something was to go wrong, they could go out. But otherwise, the robot is just out there um, performing, say, a repetitive type of task on its own, but we might be able to get it done and cover more area um, with the crew uh, supporting. Awesome. Well, thank you again, Ernie. And I know I took up some time going through that question twice. So let's go ahead and move on at this point and we will have additional time for discussion at the end of the session. Thank you. Our next you. talk is gonna come from Ben Feist. And Ben is bringing us horizontally integrated informatics to support science operations in human space flight. Take it away, Ben. Great, is everybody able to hear me and can you see my slides? We can. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so really, I'm, I'm going to talk today about how managing our mission data can enable science support operations uh, when we go on future missions. That's essentially what this is all about. Um, first, to just describe what the problem is, um, really, this is about PDS uh, is what we use for our remote sensing and our current robotic missions. Um, but how can we make data useful during the mission um, when addressing this uh, this problem, science and engineering data are equally valuable for human exploration missions, especially when it's real time. So rather than just thinking only as scientific data and does it go into the PDS repository, how can we enable science and operations data to work together? And another way to say this is that good science data management equals better ops situational awareness and better ops data management equals better con mission context for our scientific data. And this is all like for real time, you know, try to merge everything all together uh, for support operations. So th the way I get, I'm gonna describe this is through these four levels of enablement. Um, we currently uh, are aware of level one where we have the instrument on the spacecraft and we're gathering the data and we can write papers and do uh, research on that data that we get. Level two is making sure that we save that data for future generations of study on the PDS. And what I'm introducing here today are levels three and four. So 
Level three is really the, the key, which is to horizontally integrate, and I'll explain what that means, locally compatible data enabling cross-disciplinary context within the mission. And then level four is doing level three, but using open data standards. So you wind up actually having uh, globally compatible data that's across missions uh, able to be uh, used. And I'll show how that's an advantage uh, in a second. So I'm gonna explain for the remainder of the talk how uh, these different three levels uh, of different efforts relate to these levels, um, focusing on different outcomes that has happened as our uh, team has worked on different systems in order to integrate these. So the first is the Petrio analog from RISE 1, often, often called RISE 4, um, which was level one uh, instrument data that we're collecting and storing by each instrument for study. Uh, and on RISE 1, we went to Kilbourne Hole, um, which is a Mar volcanic crater in New Mexico. Uh, and there we uh, conducted field geology training. Uh, we had remote sensing instruments such as LIDAR. Uh, and we had uh, handheld instruments such as uh, laser breakdown induced spectrometer uh, that Kelsey Young is using here in this image. Um, and we were using these things uh, throughout an EVA, and these were all siloed into uh, their respective mission uh, SD cards and things like that of, of this data all just being pulled together. And it was our job to try to move this data to a level three like um, enablement by tying it all together temporally. Um, and uh, we don't have a level two because this is not planetary data, so we're not putting this in the PDS, but we wanted to get it to level three. Uh, and the result of being able to do that uh, resulted in this prototype, uh, which was a manual effort to get to level three for one of the EVAs, because these instruments aren't designed to do this. Um, so this prototype, uh, you can see uh, a digital terrain model uh, where there's GPS tracks uh, being walking through it. And this digital terrain model was uh, generated by Jose Hurtado at UTEP. Um, and you can actually see the drone in the bottom right that's gathering that data on the clock during the EVA. And then we have chest cameras. And you can see here, uh, astronaut Butch Wilmore marking waypoints where he wants uh, LIBS and XRF data to be gathered on an ash deposit. And then we store that instrument data in the waypoint that was generated during the EVA. So we're essentially coalescing the siloed data back together into when it occurred uh, during the mission and, and creating this ability to kind of play back and walk through and get a way better understanding of what occurred than even you may have had during the real time event. Uh, this prototype is several years old, and it was the very first example of this approach being used on analogs. Uh, the next example is at the Neutral Buoyancy Lab, and this is non-scientific data. This is operations data, and it's also stored at level one at the NBL, um, where we have videos, suit telemetry, and audio. And uh, I did a similar effort to try to get uh, angle joint information about the under, uh, underwater remote manipulator arm video and telemetry and suit telemetry and pulled it all together and said, hey, would this be a useful thing if we could get our ops data all organized like this? And then demonstrated using a uh, anomaly event, is this, would this be something useful for actually tracking um, things that go wrong or are unexpected? Uh, what if you had a way to rewind and just go back and do this? Like how much time would that save in your anomaly investigation? The answer is a lot of time. <laughs> so this is a manual level three again uh, for operations data. And uh, this is a, a picture of uh, the nearly completed uh, application that is near automated level three, um, but it still requires some underlying data to be gathered in a different way. This approach is being applied at Johnson Space Center on, under a program that uh, the authors of this talk are working on called EMSS. It consists of three uh, component applications. The first is Maestro, which is an, a digital EDA task planning platform that I won't talk about today but it's basically gathering um, the, the EVA tasks that are being planned to be done in a way that can be digital, digitally recorded as to what events occurred when. And we have Aegis, which is a GIS uh, uh, application that allows for traverse planning and tracking, similarly gathering information in a digital form. And then CODA, which is an application that I'm gonna talk more about today, which is the playback of all this contextually gathered data that's gathered at level three natively using those first two applications. Two minutes. Sure. So the, the first application, uh, we have ISS mission context, uh, where CODA is being uh, using the level two data that's gathered by the ISS mission, uh, and it's gathered, and you can actually go to it at this URL um, if you are on the NASA network, and you can check it out. Uh, but this is CODA in action. 
uh, going through an EVA, you can actually see the different downlinks of, of data that's available. You can see where the ISS was over the earth at any given time. For any point uh, over the, since 2013, this data is live uh, and available through the CODA application. So here you can see a playback of a moment of an EVA and uh, you can pick down link one and two and you can actually see the photos appear as they come. It's also useful for non-EVA events. Here's uh, the latest uh, Crew Dragon docking. And because you create a system like this just for EVA purposes, you actually wind up enabling all kinds of operations. CODA is also used um, on field training. This is uh, one of the rock yard tests that we did at JSC. And uh, here's an example of the rock yard uh, further along that same training event uh, where you can see the simulated lighting conditions that Noah Petro brought up earlier today being very challenging. The future of CODA will be at level four, uh, where here's a picture of it, where you can think of it, a certain task during EVA with met rate data and task accomplishment statistics, being able to jump immediately to that same task during training at the NBL. Um, so that you, you can now trace across EVAs and across training events, similar events and similar tasks and measure those things. For Surveys RISE 2 that's currently underway, we are going to be gathering field data in uh, November at level two and inventing pipelines that will get it to an automated level three. And in 2022, we'll be able to utilize those pipelines to get near real time mission science support in the field. And guess what we've made along the way as a natural byproduct of getting coded to level four? We've made Apollo in real time um, for all the current and future mission data that will have our instruments and our research uh, data all placed in context of that mission. And when we go back to the moon with Artemis, we'll be enabling ops and science uh, with Artemis in real time. Uh, sorry for going over time and I'm pleased to take any questions. Thank you for your attention. Awesome. Thank you, Ben. That's really interesting stuff. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. So um, now if anybody does have questions, feel free to put them in the chat or um, just speak up, raise your hand, um, however, however you feel comfortable. Mary, it's Darlene. I have a question. Sure. Sure, go ahead. Thank you, Ben. That was so interesting. Um, such super cool work. And um, I just wanted to find out if you're aware of uh, XGDS that has been in use with the analogs since about 2008. Um, and I think there's lots of beautiful synergies between what you're describing and what that product's doing, as well as OpenMCT, which is uh, flight certified that's gonna be used on the Viper mission, which is incorporating a lot of the learning that the you know, XGDS product that's been deployed underwater, on land, all over the place, um, has learned over the years in terms of how to synthesize and you know, data and support science decisioning um, over latency as well as in near real time. So anyways, um, I don't know if you guys are in touch with them, but I'd be happy to make that connection because this, this is great work you guys are doing. I think, uh, you know, especially given that OpenMCT and XGDS are, are open source, probably lots of great um, uh, partnerships and, and discussions to be had. That's yes, it. for sure. And we were very much aware of those programs. Um, the, the slight difference is that XGDS is essentially the repository for the data um, and the visualization of that data. And I think that's, that's, a, that's a, a byproduct of when it was made and, and what it needed to solve. We are trying to deliberately just be a visualization of data that is stored by other repositories so that we never wanna keep data ourselves, in other words, because we recognize that you, know, you don't wanna create new places for data to go and be difficult to manage going forward. So we have, we have lots of systems. So another way to put that is, for XGDS, we, we could use that as a source of information um, to visualize in the way that we are uh, for, for science support. Um, and, but yes, we, we are in touch with those teams and we are learning as much as we can from all their experience. They're way far ahead of us in many regards uh, with the work that they've done. Great, yeah, thanks for that question, Darlene. Um, there is another question for you in the chat, but uh, given time, we, I think we'll move on to the next talk. Um, so feel free to answer in the chat or we can also bring it up uh, in the discussion session after the talks are over. Cool, right, thanks so everyone. <laughs> All right, I'll go back to Kayla to introduce the next speaker. Awesome, thank you. Our next talk is gonna come from Sarah Seitz and this one is going to be about data synthesis for drilling and sampling in analog studies. So Sarah, it's all you. All right, thank you very much. 
I'm going to share my screen. Is everyone able to see that? Yep, looks great. Okay. And we just sent out a presentation, but I'm not sure we yeah. sent to. There we are. Thank you very much. So uh, my name is Sarah Seitz. I work uh, in the Deployable Automated Technologies Group at NASA Ames Research Center with Dr. Brian Glass. And uh, over the last number of years, uh, we've been working on a number of analog site studies uh, in a variety of locations, uh, including the Rio Tinto mine in Spain, uh, Houghton Crater in the High Arctic in Canada, and most recently, uh, the Atacama Rover Astrobiology Drilling Studies Project uh, in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Uh, we have been working on uh, synthesis of our data, um, noting that uh, particularly on this project, uh, we had a group of as many as 40 uh, uh, co-investigators and collaborators at a time on site with us, uh, multiple instruments and uh, samples and data returning to multiple organizations and locations uh, at the end of each season. And in addition to that, uh, our four successive se field seasons uh, traveling uh, not only uh, to the Atacama Desert, uh, but to multiple locations uh, within uh, the Atacama and uh, collecting samples there. So our challenge uh, has been to synthesize the data that we've generated uh, from uh, in particular the sites where we conducted our uh, rover drilling studies uh, with our instruments on board the rover and uh, where we conducted our remote operations during our final year. Um, we have multiple locations even within uh, our local site uh, at uh, Estacion Yungay in the Atacama Desert. And the challenge for us um, is not only that we're working across these multiple sites, uh, these multiple instruments, um, but also over time. And uh, with the instruments being in development as we move through this process, uh, we have some samples that are being uh, collected uh, and delivered to instruments on board the rover. Uh, other samples uh, due to operations timing uh, or readiness are being collected manually. And in addition to that, in the field, uh, we're logging both manual notes uh, out in the elements and, uh, and the, te the telemetry uh, on board with the drill on the rover. Uh, so we found ourselves with a challenge both uh, tracing that data and making the, that sample analysis traceable back to the drill data itself. Uh, the challenge that we've been working with um, over recent months is how to model this workflow and bring it back and anchor it to the uh, data model uh, that we want to have so that we can visualize this data um, and ultimately uh, make a, a model that correlates it spatially uh, and in time. Uh, currently, what we're focused on is our depth logs, which we generate uh, often through manual notes that are taken in the field uh, uh, while out on traverses. Uh, the sample curation that we have uh, as we gather our samples, both in the instruments and uh, uh, and manually uh, using, uh, depending on the individual study and uh, the day of our operations may have a different motivation in terms of it being a, a tracer study or a study using a given cleaning protocol um, and correlating those um, again to our drill telemetry, uh, which uh, is sampled of course at a very different rate, uh, multiple times per second um, with its own onboard uh, reporting and analysis. Uh, one of the key challenges that we found with that is, again, because we're working year to year through these projects, 
Um, there's a range of uh, formats uh, that end up being used. And uh, we also have uh, personnel in different roles uh, rotating in and out uh, as we work in the field. So um, we've been working most recently um, to evaluate one, our software options, um, but also to uh, begin developing a data schema that would allow us to merge these data streams together, um, taking into account that we have multiple file formats, that we have multiple collaborators, um, including people who are um, rotating in and out of op operator roles uh, within the field when we're out there exposed to the elements, um, and considering that that data is being generated and stored at different times and in different locations um, before, during, and after the field season. Uh, one thing that we've noticed uh, even uh, in the course of this project uh, is that it seems to be a common thread of conversation within the terrestrial analogs uh, community um, and a common challenge, um, and that many people seem to be discussing uh, how the PDS4 uh, model um, is helpful, but not quite a fit for the way that data is generated in the field. Um, when we look at uh, our work currently, um, we're transferring our manually collected notes um, with our timestamps um, into spreadsheets and uh, gathering them that way and ultimately looking to correlate them uh, to the data that's generated uh, from our drill telemetry and also from our instruments. So our uh, most recent intern from University of Puerto Rico, uh, uh, Javier Rodriguez, worked uh, last semester to begin formatting a database um, and developing a schema um, that we could evaluate uh, for linking our sample curation and our depth log to our drill telemetry. Um, we're now in a phase where we're currently working uh, to evaluate, one, how we want to uh, visualize uh, the, the spatial data component, uh, as well as uh, the time and other uh, layers of sample analyses. Um, our ultimate conclusion has been that ArcGIS Online is probably the best option uh, for us to go with for something that's a long-term uh, location and a centralized location where um, our collaborators can access it easily. Um, currently, we're working on formatting and labeling conventions and uh, the mundane details that allow us to link to that uh, drill telemetry and uh, working also with the software itself that controls the drill. Um, to gather those reporting functions and uh, merge that data in automatically. Um, I believe I'm close to my time. So uh, what I do want to say is that we're very eager to continue conversations and continue learning from our NASA and USGS colleagues. Uh, it's been very informative over recent weeks uh, to see what uh, other colleagues are doing, and we're looking forward to continuing uh, that journey. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat, but now if anyone has questions, um, please just unmute yourself and feel free to ask. Right. Well, I see. I have some questions, but it's um, I'm actually talking next, and yours feeds really um, well into mine. Um, so I guess um, just a quick question: Do you have? Um, seems like you put a lot of planning into these charts and figuring this all out. Do you, can you give an estimate of like how much time it took your team to come up with these kind of schema for um, how to record everything before, during, and after the field field season?
at least it looks like we may have lost Sarah, at least for now. <laughs> okay, I was wondering. Yeah, I was actually wondering if it was on my end of, because we do have a, a thunderstorm brewing outside. So, well, <clears throat> in that case, with time, we can save her, save questions for her for our discussion session. Sounds good. And as you all know, our next talk is coming from Elise herself. And this talk is going to be the case for a terrestrial analog data portal. All right, let me share my screen. And great, are you seeing it in presenter mode or the correct mode? Looks good from here. Okay, sounds good. Well, um, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for um, hanging around. Um, I'll get right into it. So, and this is um, a perfect, uh, Sarah's talk was perfect uh, to lead into this because I'm going to be talking about um, community needs for data preservation and um, our work in developing a terrestrial analogs data portal. Oops. Uh, there. there we go, okay. So many of us are familiar with the PDS, the Planetary Data System. This is an existing highly respected and highly used repository that is primarily used for planetary mission data. It has a very well-defined data and metadata standards, and it's also peer reviewed. Now the problem um, when it comes to terrestrial analog data is that there are no current standards for archiving and um, <clears throat> there's no current, standards or over repository. And in addition, like Sarah mentioned, there's a huge range of data types and formats and volumes when it comes to collecting data in the field. And so it's, it's pretty tricky to figure these things out about how to properly archive your data. And this is something that's recognized uh, throughout the community. The PDE IRV report that came out earlier this year had a finding that there's a need for a primary repository for planetary analog data. We also see this, uh, within the community. So here at the USGS, uh, two years ago, we had a, at least a community survey. Those, uh, as a summary of those findings, we found that most people who responded are willing to share their data and samples, and they would also use an archive to find existing data and samples of planetary analog studies. However, there is a lack of knowledge and a lack of guidance in how to find this data and, and also how to archive the data. So it's not uh, common knowledge how to archive the data. And also everyone has their own data in kind of disparate repositories. Um, so they can be difficult to locate. In addition, um, there's a general lack of funding and time to complete the archiving process. We revisited some of these themes last month during the Terrestrial Analogs for Planetary Exploration Workshop. We had a breakout session on data archiving and once again, people mentioned that they don't know really what it takes to create a good repository. That folks aren't, don't know, they don't have the proper guidance towards archiving their data. And a big part of that is time. It actually takes a good chunk of time to properly ar archive data. And if we don't know how much time is involved, we can't write that into our proposals, then we don't have the funding to do that archiving. And it kind of, um, it kind of falls off our plates because we all we're all very busy with other things. Another big topic of conversation during the workshop was that uh, a data and a data archive needs to make sure that the data that's put in there is usable and it's very trustworthy. So usability and trustworthy are dependent on having clear metadata standards. And then on top of that, we have to make sure that there's a low barrier to access and use. We don't wanna make it exceedingly difficult for folks to access this data and use this data, especially if they're their early career or maybe using a method or data type they haven't used before. So at the USGS, at Astrogeology, we have started creating our own data portal, um, which is pretty exciting. And this is based on the USGS Science-Based Catalog. So the USGS Science-Based is a repository, the trusted long-term repository that already exists. We use it internally within the USGS to, to host our data, and um, then it becomes publicly available. And it has, it has strict uh, metadata standards, it's trusted within the community. It allows for persistent URLs and central search and discovery of the entire USGS catalog. 
And then on top of that, it also meets the legal and functional uh, requirements uh, needed by NASA for a data portal uh, repository. So it's nice that we have this catalog already available that we can build on to make a terrestrial analog data portal. Now, what we're hoping, well, not hoping, we're going to do it. Um, when the data portal is fully functional, it will allow for both direct hosting of data so that folks can upload their data directly to our repository, but also connected to other trusted repositories. So that I know there are other, um, I know there's an astrobiology repository, there are other repositories out there, and we want to be able to link to them so that we don't have to recreate everything and resubmit um, everything. And some good news. We have a data site that is functional as of this month. It is open for archiving contributions. And um, this first version allows for basic geospatial and text search of science base. So just as a quick preview, this is what the, the main page looks like. There's a URL here. I can copy it into the chat after, uh, after I'm done speaking. And you can see in the main uh, interface right here, we have some geospatial data. Right now, it's showing uh, the impact crater database for the Earth, and we're eventually going to update it with more. You can see there's one, one volcano up here, polar in Iceland, as our one, our one um, volcanic analog for now. And then the basic functionalities that it has so far um, up here is information about how to contribute. So you can click on there. There's information about how you can how you can contribute our metadata standards, the contact info. We'd love it if people get in contact with us if you have, want to uh, start contributing data. Uh, you can also currently search by location. So you draw a box, you can find um, all the data submitted that's within the science base. So this doesn't it doesn't necessarily cure query anything that's terrestrial analog related. Right now, it just it just uh, returns all the data geospatially within that area. You can also search by keywords. So look up volcanic or meteor crater, whatever you're interested in. Like I said, this is um, beta. It's very, very new website. So uh, if you visit, feel free to offer some uh, suggestions about, about uh, improving it in the future. <clears throat> so going back to metadata, just because this is such an essential part of archiving data, um, we recognize that metadata is really essential to accessing, discovering, using, and trusting any sort of data um, that we're going to find. And Science Space, which is really nice about our this data portal, is that Science Space already supports uh, high standards for metadata, and it has um, open web services for geospatial data. And we're working on having interoperability beyond the system, so in connecting other trusted repositories to our systems. You know, some of the challenges with metadata, especially, you know, with field work, as we've been saying that there are so many different types of data, is that you need to have commonalities for some entry types, but then also be able to accommodate specific needs of those different data types. So um, coming up with, meta, you know, properly having metadata standards for things like field photos, but also for magnetometer measurements. On top of that, um, one of the main things, and, and PDS does this, is being able to handle and um, include different process levels of data. So having raw, processed, and derived data sets. This is really helpful um, just for, for different levels of scientists. You know, if you have someone new to the field, they're going to want derived data sets, but then other folks might want to um, get different things out. They might want the raw data. You're about one minute. Thank you. <clears throat> so as a use case, um, I'm part of the... Survey Geodes team, which overlaps a lot with the NASA GIF team. We used uh, the pandemic and our inability to do field work as an opportunity to look into data capabilities. So we've been working with them um, to look at metadata standards, to look at how we can best uh, share data, both with the public, so through something like ArcGIS Online, sharing data that way, but also internally before things can be um, properly archived, sharing things within a team using Google Drives and things like that. Another thing we've been working on is developing complementary readme file, read file templates. So these are templates that folks can take into the field and it helps um, with all those steps in prepping for field work, when you're in the field, after the field, what you need to do, what you need to record in order to um, get to the point where you can create this robust metadata that then can be shared with the community later on. And, uh, Next step for that is to link these repos the 
existing repositories that Gift is using to our repository. And finally, as some next steps, yeah, we plan to, we want to continue extending the capabilities of the Analogs Data Portal. You know, since we're in the very early stages, there's, there's a lot of opportunities here. We are also working on collating field guides, both for in-field learning and for virtual learning, and also in expanding our physical sample collection. The USGS, we already house a few sample collections, and we are looking into the feasibility of expanding that to house more collections. Um, cool. So with that, we have, I'll take any questions. I might be out of time for questions, but we can talk more in the discussion. Um, but please contact us if you have, if you want to visit the website, um, give us some feedback. If you also want to contribute, um, you know, for now it's going to be test cases, but we welcome all sorts of test cases to try to um, input data into our, our data portal where we're really excited to share it with the community and we want to hear what you have to say. Cool. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Elise. We do have a couple of questions in the chat for you. And can take one of those right. now or go ahead and move on. Okay, you know, I think I am went a little over time, so um, I'll try to answer these in the chat and or we can bring them back up in the after, in the discussion after the, the talks are over. Great. Well, let me, <clears throat> oops. <laughs> Sorry, all right, our next talk is by Kayla and I'm introducing her, but I need to, there we go, get my slideshow out of the way so that I can properly introduce her. I got you. Okay, Let's I got you. you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, Sorry about that. Uh, okay, so our next talk is from uh, my co-host Kayla Berry. And she's going to be speaking on NASA's Planetary Analogs website, Analog Fieldwork for Broad Audiences. Thank All right, you. take it away. Thanks, Elise. Yeah, thanks everyone for the opportunity to be here with you today and present. Can you see my slides? Yes, we can. Awesome. Oh, dear. Yeah, that's not where we want to be. All right, that's where we want to be. So, uh, as part of my role on the public engagement team at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, I co-lead development of NASA's Planetary Analogs website, along with Nikki Welly at the University of Maryland. I want to say a huge thanks to our co-authors, Jacob Richardson and Molly Wasser, as well as the teams that support this effort, including two survey nodes, RISE and GEODES, and also the Goddard Instrument field team. Finally, and very importantly, this project is enabled by the contributions and perspectives of many, many individuals throughout this community, including a lot of folks who are on the line today. So a huge thanks to everyone who has contributed photos and proofreads and other feedback throughout the process. So NASA's Planetary Analogs website is designed to provide a brief, approachable, introduction to analog science, particularly geologic analogs. We hope that visitors to our site will come away understanding that the quest to understand our solar system begins close to home. We emphasize geologic analog fieldwork in part because NASA already has separate websites dedicated to mission analogs and astrobiology analogs. And so we are here to kind of provide a little bit different kind of information, but we also realize that these stories are all interconnected and there's a lot of exciting stuff going on uh, throughout all of these fields and we want to make sure that we provide appropriate context. So we do also provide some examples of mission and astrobiology analogs uh, with links out for more information. In addition to some basics about geologic analog science, we hope that visitors to our site will come away with the implicit or explicit understanding that it's people who get this work done. And we really hope that folks will be able to see themselves participating in this kind of work if that's something that they are interested in doing. To this end, we 
try to choose images that feature scientists at work in the field in many of our comparisons. Oh, excuse me. Uh, and particularly, we try to feature early career scientists. And if this is something that you are interested in contributing to, uh, we would love to incorporate your perspective as well. So the content that you've just seen is sampled from our homepage, which launched just this February. And in June of this year, last month, we were able to roll out our second major feature, the Analog Explorer Interactive Gallery. And we'll spend the next few minutes taking a peek at some of that new content. So in the Analog Explorer Interactive Gallery, visitors are invited to compare images side by side. And each image pair includes an analog research site here on Earth, such as in this example, Lava Beds National Monument in California. Thank you, Ernie Bell, for this fantastic photo. And as you can see, we've paired this with an orbital image of the Marius Hills region on the moon from LRO, showing a probable skylight into what may be a lava tube structure. Uh, you can see a small note at the bottom, the images are not to scale. As probably many of you are already aware, the lunar skylight that you see in the right-hand picture is uh, to take up the better part of the football field, so important to be aware of. Our next example compares UAV imagery from near the foot of Aska Volcano in Iceland with orbital imagery from high rise on the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. These are both images of gravel ripples. Again, not to scale, the images, uh, excuse me, the ripples in the right hand image are uh, spaced out about 10 times as far as the ones in the left hand image. And the final example we'll take a look at today is a classic Death Valley National Park in California. So as again, I think many folks in this room are familiar with, uh, Death Valley is a great analog for regions of Mars, including the location of um, the Viking 2 lander, which you see here. This is one of the very first images ever returned from the Martian surface at Utopia Planitia and bears a striking similarity to Death Valley. Uh, of course, Mars 2020, uh, that mission also used Death Valley uh, in fact in, in a different way as a place to practice hazard avoidance for the land air vision system. Now, when visitors come to the Analog Explorer Gallery, they're not just gonna see these interactive sliders uh, standing alone. We also provide some selected contextual information. So we'll take a look at the same entry. This is just a screenshot from the gallery. And you can see that visitors find a few sentences of background information, some links out to learn more, of course, image credits, downloads, and in addition, a small map showing the location of the analog site on Earth. Users can browse analog locations throughout the gallery in a slideshow view, in a list view, or by looking at a world map, which we'll take a look at. Oh, there's our toggled view. And here's our map view where visitors to the gallery can explore sites by clicking and dragging and zooming on this interactive map. We have 12 entries currently represented in the Analog Explorer Gallery. Two minutes left, Kayla. Thank you. And here I've pulled content from three additional entries just to give you a little bit more of a sense of the kinds of comparisons that we are inviting our visitors to make. Here we have examples of shield volcanoes in New Mexico and on Venus, uh, an ice quake detection experiment in Alaska, which is relevant to questions about Enceladus, and astrobiology work in Utah, which is relevant to Mars and other locations. So these are the first two waves of our content development process, but we are excited to continue building this project out and continue finding new ways to communicate the really exciting and compelling work that you all are doing. Uh, we have found visual storytelling to be a great fit for this subject matter with appropriate alt text and appropriate attention to accessibility to make sure that the visual information is not the only information that is presented. We will also be diving deeper into written content, we hope in the future, providing some short feature articles that give our visitors a little bit more of an in-depth look at some of the concepts that I just touched on 
in these two initial waves of content. And as you know, if this is something that uh, is of interest to you, I would love to get in touch and chat and hear about what you're doing and what ideas you have. Feedback on the site is always welcome. This is a young project and um, we are excited to continue working on it. So uh, with that, I'll pop up a few links and say another big thanks to all of our collaborators and thanks to you all for your time and attention today. Cool. Thank you, Kayla. That's uh, a really, a really fun resource. That's really, those pictures are really, really amazing. Does anyone, we have a couple minutes. You are on time, which is great. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for Kayla? I'd be happy to take oh. any questions later too, just to keep us moving along. for sure i have one quick question for you though before and we can move on just um do you have recommendations for folks in taking the photos is there are there some things that make better photos than other photos for the website oh what a great question uh, so photos of people are always great with the permission of the first person in the photo of first um, the examples that i think are the most engaging are the ones that have um, really clear visual parallels between the Earth location and the extraterrestrial location. Um, like, for instance, the Death Valley example that we're looking at where the horizons line up and the terrain is very similar. And you can really see all the way across the image that the two locations have a lot in common. Uh, I think those are just a lot of fun and really do a great job of, of conveying in an intuitive way some of the similarities that we find in planetary bodies for the solar system that are important in ways that aren't always intuitive. But if we can really see the similarities side by side, I think that's a great entry point. Cool, very cool. So we should try to have an image in mind when we go to the field and try to recreate it. I like that. If you have one, that's fabulous. And if not, that's homework for me and that's good too. <laughs> That's great. All right. Well, thank you, Kayla. We can move on to our last talk of the session. And then after that, we'll have plenty of time for discussion. So uh, um, Darlene, you are up next. So our last talk of this session is from Darlene Lim, and she is going to be speaking on considerations toward building inclusive analog work environments. Great. So Darlene, if you hello. can. Uh, hello. I am here. Hopefully you can hear me. I'm having some issues, however, um, getting my slide deck to share. Hold on one okay. second. Let's um, see if it works. I think it just doesn't want to do it in Zoom today. Oh no. Okay. Tell well, you what we're gonna do. I believe Mike, uh, who is our IT person, should be able to share your slides. If if you put them in the Dropbox, did you perhaps put them in the Dropbox? I did not. It's been a busy week, so hold on one second. <laughs> I it's totally, totally my fault. I could probably no problem. I can give this talk without slides as well. But let me just try and download it while we're getting started here, so I can keep this on time. Um, okay. So, and like I said, we have plenty of. Um, we have a, a lot of space for discussion afterwards. So, um, okay. Bro. Yeah, and Dar Darlene, my. Uh, oh, I mean, sorry myself. about that. Had an echo. Um, I put my Gmail in the chat. If you want to send those over, I can try serving them from my end. Okay, copy. Let me just see if I can open them up in PowerPoint and then um, I'll kind of work this in real time while we get started and then um, uh, see if I can solve this over here. And if not, I will definitely just shoot it over to you. Um, so, the title sure. of our talk is. Uh, and, and Elise, is it, is it good if I get started now? Sorry, I was muted. <laughs> yeah, go on ahead, that's great. Okay, sounds good. So the title of our talk is Considerations Towards Building Inclusive, Safe, Analog Work Environments. And so I think the first word is really one I wanna stress that I'm putting forward today on behalf of myself, um, all the co-authors uh, that are listed in our abstract and that hopefully I'll be able to show you in a couple seconds uh, through the slides, um, and then so many other people, uh, colleagues, you know, that I've managed to have the privilege to work with over the over the years. So these are considerations. It's food for thought. Um, it's definitely not meant to be a prescriptive thought, or, or pardon me, a prescriptive um, presentation, but rather a starting point 
for a conversation um, that has been ongoing, of course, in our community, um, and that uh, you know we wanted to to share our thoughts on, and then to hopefully facilitate going forward, so that we can evolve as a as a group, as a community, and and continue to get some amazing work done together in the most you know inclusive and safe um, uh, work manner possible. So let me just pause for one second and see if I can actually share now that I've downloaded the slides as a um, as a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, let's try this one. Nope, it's not going to work. Okay. All right. So um, I think what we'll do then is, uh, in the interest of time, how would you guys like me to proceed? Do you want me to try and shoot it over to you in an email? I think it's fairly large. I can also show you, share a link. How, how about I do that? Yeah, um, the way it works. Okay, let me get that to you. Copy, pardon, send that to you one second. All right, standby mic is coming your way via email. And I'm going to share the deck with you as well, Mike. Sorry, darling, what was that question again? I'm going to share the, the, be sure to share it with you as well. So you should be able to just get into it without having to ask me for permission. Okay, great. And if not, you're just going to hear my voice and we'll deal with that. That's <laughs> unfortunately not exactly what was the plan, but I think it'll go. I don't know where I got them right here. Sweet. That's awesome. Oh, perfect. And like I said, we have plenty of, um, there was plenty of discussion time built into this session. So it's all right that we've gone over. Oh, well, thanks, Elise. Thanks for your kindness. Um, okay. So, uh, let me just back up and, and uh, acknowledge the co-authors on this particular presentation here. But again, I just want to stress, you know, this really is um, a roll up of thoughts that have come in over the years through experience, through readings, through conversations around how to, um, you know, consider and to think about building towards this, this inclusivity and safety within our analog work environments. So Mike, if you don't mind, please going to the next uh, slide, that would be great. Thank you. Um, so very quickly, uh, you know, this is me. Um, I've been working in the field of analog research for many, many years now, and now actually have the joy of taking so much of that learning and applying it to a flight mission. I'm the uh, deputy, one of two deputy project scientists um, for the Viper mission. But really, I should I show you this slide too because I, you know, this is this this the considerations that we put forward have been from the many hundreds of people that I've had the joy of working with over the years on land, underwater, you know, pole to pole and everywhere in between. Um, and that's, uh, that's so I just wanna make sure that that representation of ideas is clear as I proceed through these slides or as Mike rolls through them for me. Okay, next slide, please, thank you. And your dog is so cute, Mike. Um, so just to start us off in terms of a framework of where the co-authors and I uh, would like to begin, you know, first of all, of course, we know there's no perfect analog, but, but analogs are so great at helping us to solve problems as we've heard about through the, you know, the series of talks today. And of course, at many different conversations and conferences, um, and they're really well suited to address issues that pertain to environments and targets beyond our planet. And field programs such as analog missions involve multidisciplinary uh, participants from around the world. And we only, you know, if you think about it, we only get to meet once or twice a year in person um, under the dynamic, intense, and demanding conditions of the field. But the rest of the time, a lot of times we're working remotely with a broad team. A lot of times we're only getting together, you know, a few times through that year to solve problems very quickly. So it's a very intense work environment, which is, which is, um, which is fairly interesting and important to acknowledge. But it's really when these multidisciplinary teams transition into an interdisciplinary whole that the magic starts to happen, the innovation, the exciting kind of intrinsic motivation that can get a team into an incredible state to solve some very difficult problems. But this transition, as we'd like to put forward as a consideration, it's really a non-trivial endeavor. And it requires a lot of thought, a lot of intention, careful and clear intention, 
preparation and execution, particularly with the objective of building towards an inclusive, holistically inclusive analog work environment. Let's go to the next slide, please. So as we've put in our abstract, you know, we like to put forward the idea that structural equality and inclusion within an analog field program, uh, it can really be advanced within the broader community if we take note and we recognize stakeholders, who they are and what they need, and that we also recognize the importance of leadership flex re reflexivity. And what that means is asking yourself as a leader, you know, whether you're, you're the PI or you're anybody in, in, in a team, from a leadership perspective, what is it that you can do to uh, improve, to ask yourself the questions of whether or not you are actually enabling the environment that we, we hope we're building towards with, you know, inclusivity and safety. So in terms of defining what a stakeholder is, we see it as anyone, any group, any entity with an interest or concern in the execution of an analog program. And so each stakeholder is fundamentally of importance to consider, to understand, and ultimately to include and inspire for the overall success of any program. And in terms of leadership, you know, we feel very much that the creation of equitable and, and inclusive analog field programs does require at least one person, such as the PI and relevant needs to be a responsible and accountable for the work structure, the team well-being, both in and out of the field and broader programmatic and public outcomes. This may seem very much like common sense to many of you, which is fantastic, but we feel that it's very important for at each at bat, you know, the leadership to reflect on this and to wonder if in fact, um, these, are the, these are goals that they're working towards. Next slide, please. So who are stakeholders to be considered? So for example, they can be stewards of the analog sites. So we find very much that what, if an analog team visits a land or a water field site, you know, typically our presence is ephemeral, but the impact of our presence on that site can be indelible in, in maybe a positive or even a negative uh, sense. And so really taking into account these stewards and the needs and considerations of these stewards and gatekeepers to those regions is really important to do from the get-go. Get -go. So for example, these types of stakeholders could be community leadership, indigenous councils, township officials, park managers, and regional businesses. And in terms of actions for consideration, we find that, for example, well in advance of the mission start, we, we like to identify and meet with these stewards to really focus in on their sensitivities and their codependencies with us, with the goal to work towards a mutually supportive and enabling relationship. And another action for consideration is to communicate the importance of, these, of being mindful of these sensitivities to the entire team early, often, and just in time. So well before we get into the field. Next slide, please. So another um, stakeholder as an example, and of course there are many stakeholders, we're just putting up a few for consideration, is the analog research and field team itself. So those who are participating in the team and each of these stakeholders has to require, has the requirement to feel safe, to be safe within their, their, work, their workspace. And this safety can be defined as their ability to perform their research and to retain their individual dignity and identity throughout their work experience with the team. So some actions for consideration is establishing a decision-making principle, a set of decision-making principles that are clear, that are repeatable and dependable when the project needs to grow, pivot, react, or realign. So as an example, we have typically um, put forward you know, these principles in order of priority of safety, environmental stewardship, and then reaching our research goals and realigned all of our decision or aligned all of our decision-making to these three mantras. Another consideration is to establish a very clear and dependable mechanism for discourse around concerns associated with safety, environmental stewardship, and research goals, and to communicate, again, these processes uh, early and often and just in time, and to provide training, retention mechanisms, and feedback opportunities, and of course, throughout this, hold people accountable. Next, next slide, please. Another stakeholder example are funding, uh, you know, those stakeholders that are, are funding your work. So for example, federal agencies, universities, special interest organizations, and et cetera. And so this is important to underscore as well to really highlight the importance of professional composure throughout the research process. And of course, there are many, many others, but in all cases, we find that it's important um, to recognize and to connect the, you know, these internal and exo, external stakeholders to each other to the purpose and vision of the program. Next slide, please. So in terms of leadership, we brought this up as well in our, in our um, 
and are abstract as a consideration. And so these are many questions that are you know, here recorded and that I'm happy to share. And I think we've also put and written into our abstract, but the leadership towards building an inclusive work environment can be enabled by reflecting on and defining these questions and many more. So what are the core values of the analog program? all the way to what are the anxieties and barriers to progress that exist within the team? Um, what additional support will be needed to enable our team to thrive? And other things such as, you know, what, what are my strengths as a leader? What are my weaknesses? Am I in need of being friends with everyone? Um, you know, do I need everyone to like, like me? And what, what could I improve from my last at bat? So very personal questions. And you know, um, we know this from experience and we also know this from the literature that principal investigators, as you see in this citation here, have the greatest power and responsibility to steward these field sites. So really the leadership is such an important aspect of enabling the inclusivity and the safety. Next slide, please. Oh, next slide. Thank you. Um, and so one other consideration is to look at the possibility of you know, being a multiplier instead of a diminisher, as an example. So um, as I'll read from this quote here from a, an article in the Harvard Business Review, most companies are adept at bringing in smart, talented people, but very few companies put as much discipline into understanding how fully they can utilize that talent. And so many managers are focused on their own ideas and capabilities so much so that they shut down the intelligence around them. And so these are considered diminishers. But the leaders that seem to amplify the intelligence around them, these are considered multipliers. And I think this, this article is very relevant to what we find in our analog teams where we have such capable, remarkable people and we want to bring them together and really amplify that, that intelligence to get to the innovation. Next slide, please. So some quick considerations and Mike, I'm going to get you to just kind of click on that button real quick. But um, you know, one of the things that we really try to enter into all of our programs with, with is that when we go into the field, as an example, it's a place of work. It's not a summer camp. And so there are very comprehensive safety plans, workplace guidelines, participant responsibilities, and codes of conduct that we tend to put forward at the get-go, um, or you know, again, early, often, and just in time. Next slide, please. Um, other other uh, documentation that we will issue in the pre-mission uh, or the pre-field deployment period are um, our reporting schematics in case something happens. We want everyone to know that there is actually a process and a protocol and accountability that we will put forward um, to mitigate as well as to report out any, um, any safety issues that may come to light in any you know, way, shape or form. Next slide, please. Um, we also have many safety uh, plans that we put forward over the years, um, you know, for each and every deployment, not just for each analog mission, but for each deployment within those missions, safety flow charts and so forth that really have, you know, learned, we've tried to really learn from some of the incident reporting that other communities such as firefighters, um, you know, and fill in the blank, many other communities use in order to ensure that there's process and protocol and accountability in, in their, um, in their you know, search to generate a safe environment. Next slide, please. As well as after the, after the field deployments, we're very careful to go over um, what happened, to conduct um, uh, a, a lot of debriefs, and um, also you know, during the, the mission itself, as we start to wrap up, we actually have uh, to-dos and a lot of protocols to ensure that the sensitivities and that the, the intrinsic motivation to maintain the workspace environment as being inclusive and safe is there right to the very end as people go home and then that transitions into, into our work you know, day to day as a team, even outside of the field. Next slide, please. Um, we also, of course, from a, a research standpoint, establish a very common professional lexicon because of course, as I mentioned, it's the, the trick is taking a multidisciplinary team and turning that into an interdisciplinary team. So to do so, you want to make sure that you're having conversations where one person is not, you know, overwhelming the other with 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 terminology that is not understood because that can very much hamper the progress and the innovation that we're we're searching for. So this can go back to you know establishing research traceability matrix and offering a real Hansel and Gretel way back, um, you know, to to what we're trying to do when conference conversations get hairy as they often do in these very complex missions. Next slide, please. Um, I wanna let you know that Elise uh, and Lauren out of the USGS ran an incredible um, you know, terrestrial breakout session where they asked myself and uh, Jacob Rich Richardson to talk about inclusivity and safety in our work environments. 
It was a 45 minute session. We provided the opportunity for anonymous input to come in around questions of inclusivity, safety, and harassment. Um, and there's a lot of information that came in there and I've summarized it quickly, You know, some of the high level elements on this slide and the next, but we are gonna be putting out um, some roll up of the learning from that particular session in the coming weeks. But we asked the entire you know, community the questions such as how does it feel to be included? And fundamentally everyone said, well, it means that I'm trusted. And then we also asked them, how does it feel to be excluded? And fundamentally what it came down to is I am lesser than. And then similarly, we asked about how the community defines a safe work environment. What are signs of a safe work environment? And they, they talked about you know, thematically clarity, transparency, a diversity in terms of the leadership, you know, solid training and, and trustworthy leadership motivated by the group's best interests rather than their own. We asked them as well, what are signs of an unsafe environment? Very interestingly, drinking came up as the number one issue um, or a very high level issue, as well as disorganization, misguided leadership and a lack of accountability and so forth. We asked them as well um, about harassment and how do you define harassment? Being ridiculed, chastised, forced into non-professional activities like drinking when you do not want to, not being taken seriously and so forth. So you'll see many of the different components of what people felt they wanted to share that day. And they were reiterated again and again, even in that very short period of time. So I think what's important in terms of the takeaway from this slide is that there are themes that many people in our community feel very similarly on the same issues. Um, and then others are surprised, but are, you know, uh, this is a way for us to put forward these thoughts and to generate conversations, which are hopefully gonna move us to a productive endpoint. Next slide, please. Um, Final oh, thoughts. I was just going to ask you to start wrapping up so we can move to discussion. So it's perfect. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thanks, Elise. Thanks. Um, so my, my final thoughts to share is that, you know, I just want to put forward that this is a very North American presentation. We have others from around the world who, of course, have joined us, uh, particularly, particularly at this NESF. Um, but the management practices, leadership style sensitivities, and so forth, you know, they will certainly differ around the world. But there are undoubtedly common cross-cutting themes that will bind our analog research programs, um, you know, globally. And so, you know, we hope that we can we can put forward these considerations that this will help to facilitate and enable conversations so we can find similarities, differences, and nuances together to explore them together, and then we can act upon our collective interests to grow and develop the the analog community. And so, uh, we all very much look forward to continued conversation. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Elise. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for that, Darlene. There was a lot in there and that was uh, very interesting and very important topics. Um, so now um, let's move into overall discussion. So I, there might are likely some unanswered questions in the chat. And um, yeah, if we, uh, and we can open it up. So anyone who has questions for any of our speakers, if any of our speakers, if any, if our speakers have questions for each other, now is a good time to speak up. Either unmute yourself. If someone is talking already, you can use the um, raise hand feature under reactions, or feel free to type things into the chat box. So yeah, here we'll open it up. I see Jacob's hand is raised. Go ahead, Jacob. Uh, I don't really have a question, but I was wondering, well, maybe it is a question. Uh, I was wondering if maybe we could go back to Kayla, um, who got a question earlier about what analogs uh, she would like to see next on, on the solar system website. Sure, yeah, thanks, Jacob. So Nick asked a really uh, exciting to me question in the chat, which was, are there specific analogs not on the site that uh, we're looking for or we'd like to highlight? And the answer to that is absolutely yes. Right now we have a lot of coverage of the, the moon and coverage of Mars. And, uh, that's all good stuff. We don't want to not have that. And we also have a little bit of coverage of some other locations, including ocean worlds and Venus. But certainly as we continue to develop content and um, expand this resource a little bit further, I would love to see 
that coverage kind of round out and continue to expand. So thanks to Nick and Catherine who already are, are making some connections in the chat and, and thanks for that question. And it looks like Jennifer Heldman has a hand up. Hi, yeah, this was a great session. So um, since Greg Schmidt is on, at least I see his name listed here, I thought maybe we could just have a conversation based on Darlene's talk because, you know, as evidenced by the thoroughness of, you know, the safety plans and the codes of conduct and the pre, during, post deployment and all of the safety and the logistics. And so, you know, Darlene has been thinking about EDI before it became in vogue, so to speak, right? So I think that she's ahead of the curve on a lot of things. And this might be an area of real survey leadership of bringing you know, the EDIA into the field work. And it might be, I'm just thinking out loud of like, you know, a high level survey managed activity because there are different teams that do field work, but to really integrate this process and really take advantage of, you know, the decades, two decades plus of work that's been done, um, you know, across survey teams and across the community um, and with USGS. And like, there's a lot of partners to bring in and um, so I just wanted to maybe just have a discussion about um, how, how we go about doing that um, and bringing the thoroughness um, that's been put forward, um, you know, to other teams and groups and whatnot. Well, well, Jen, um, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned that. First of all, I love the idea. And um, it, it's, it's funny, we must have had a telepathic link because I sent a private message to Darlene just before you, you got on to say that we ought to think about uh, fashioning what she put down into guidelines um, for us that we can then you know, extend to the community potentially. So I absolutely love your idea and, and let's, uh, let's move forward with it perhaps, um, perhaps through the analog focus group that uh, you and she and Tim run or, or maybe, uh, maybe some other way. Love it. Yeah, it sounds good. And I guess I should ask Darlene since I kind of put her on the spot too. <laughs> <What'd she do? laughs> uh, so <laughs> it sounds great. I just saw the uh, your your chat to me, Greg, and absolutely. And then Joe uh, asked if there is a best practices or standards for developing analog test site procedures and safety plans. You know, Joe. So what? What uh, I shared very rapidly, you know, I feel like, I don't know if you guys seen Toy Story, but the pig, when he watches TV, it just goes at, you know, rapid pace. It felt like that today. There's a, there's a lot that um, we can share, but I, I want to make sure that, you know, again, I, stre I stress and underscore the word and highlight the word considerations, because um, every time I have a conversation, as we just recently did, as, as enabled by Elise and, and Lauren at USGS, the community has so many wonderful ideas, so many thoughts about, you know, say they, they if if they've come from a military background, you know, there there are, again, there's process and protocol, and um, methods for moving towards a safe and account accountable environment, and so beyond what we've done, this is this is what we do. This is our baseline. This is what we think about when we move forward, and we know through experience, it's it's pretty good. But there's a lot we can get to a much better place real fast, um, and you know we we have to find a way to make sure that we open up this conversation and and learn from learn from the community at large. But indeed, um, we're very happy to put forward what we have as a as a you know as a again a consideration or um, a, a use case that you know people can take and tweak and make better because that's that's really what we we hope will happen is we'll evolve. Yeah, that sounds great. Let's uh, let's let's move forward. What a what a wonderful idea. Yeah, I I really like that idea too. I think it's great. Maybe it's something in the um, I don't know if everyone's aware, but there's a survey EDI group that meets every other Friday. And so this could be a good a good discussion in that space. And perhaps that's a good space too to figure out the next steps. Because yeah, we don't want to let this let this fall off our radar. Great idea, Elise. That's let's do it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Sounds good. 
But we could have a joint EDI analogs focus group, focus group meeting to cover this topic. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Okay. It just keeps on getting better. <laughs> I was inspired by Elisa's idea. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Love it. We'll make it, uh, we'll make it happen. Let's do that. Yeah. I think that's a really good idea. Keep this conversation moving. I think there's, there's so many good ideas and yeah, we don't want to, we don't want to lose them. So cool. How fun. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you everyone. All right. Um, so I see a question in the chat uh, for myself from Sarah. Um, she writes, what do you recommend as a starting point for teams of non-data scientists who are looking at reworking their field analog data to be compatible with the USGS analog site? Um, and that is a really good question. Um, and what this lies in, as I spoke about, is, is the metadata. So I in, up, above here, uh, somewhere, I can put it in again, I can, is our the link to our web page. Um, and if you um, look on that, click on that main link and go over to how to contribute, there are some very good first steps in going through there and looking at our data requirements. And there's also, you know, I don't, yeah, so there's metadata requirements. So essentially what it would be is making sure that you have, an, that your meta, you can create the metadata for your data so that it'll fit into the data portal. So if you go to that link, go over to how to contribute. Um, one of the cool things about ScienceBase is that it has a metadata wizard. And um, as I'm saying this, I'm realizing that might be a tool that's only available to USGS folks. Um, but uh, I can look into that or, you know, folks can try to click on the link and see if it works for them. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I think that would be the main step is looking at our metadata requirements. And um, if you can't, it's totally, um, if it's not perfectly clear on the website, because like I said, this is first draft of this website. And so we want to make sure that it is accessible to everyone and re readable by everyone. So if the metadata standards aren't clear on the website, email me. Um, Mark Hunter is the other main contact for the data portal. So contact either of us and we can definitely work with you to help um, to help make your data work for our data portal. Um, this is very much a work in progress. And so at this point, yeah, we are looking for contributions and um, we're asking, yeah, these first few people that contribute, the first few data sets are really gonna be test cases with working together um, to figure out the best way to do this because we do wanna create something that is easy for the community to use and access. Um, yeah, so thank you for that question. I was jump in and just read out an exchange that happened earlier in the chat as well, in case anyone is not accessing the chat. Uh, Joan Renefra asks, Ben, is code available for the public? And then Vice replies, could be available to the public, but the data it visualizes hasn't got through export control. Um, so for more info about that, I'll open it up to Ben if you'd like to add anything there. Yeah, thanks. Um, Coda is currently inside NASA and it's using data that is inside NASA. And NASA has a process called export control where we make sure that before any information is ever released to the public, um, that we know that it can be released to the public forever. Um, there is a pipeline for, I believe, Public Affairs Office where they can do that. And, you know, you can watch on YouTube a live stream of NASA TV during an EVA. And that, so that's clearly a real-time export that's happening. Um, so once we do get all the planetary data uh, gathered in a way that can be visualized with, with software, which is our current step, um, as soon as the public engagement conversation starts, we'll be ready to just flip the switch and uh, have real-time information available to the public if we can create those pipelines for export. Um, but uh, so that, sorry for the long lesson about how NASA works. <laughs> With data, but uh, that's why CODA is currently not outside the NASA firewall. All right, thank you, Ben. Thank you. 
I'll add another question to the mix here that uh, came to mind during Sarah's talk, but actually I think it's relevant to a few of our speakers today. So uh, maybe we can open it up a little bit. I'm curious as to, uh, in, in the process of trying to get all of this incoming data into a structure and format that's more accessible and available to more researchers, how much do you see that happening retroactively? Um, and are, are there totally different challenges on that front? I zoned out for a second. Can you repeat your question, Kayla? <laughs> sure, sure. Um, just curious hearing uh, from you and from Sarah, and I think this kind of connects even out a little further to um, about trying to get planetary analog research data together into a, a form that is um, more easily used by more people. Um, or, and, and I apologize if this is implied and I missed it, but is archiving data retroactively as a major part of that plan, or is this mostly looking towards future data collection? Cool, yeah, that is a really good question. And I think it's like fundamental to a lot of the, a lot of the things some of us talked about. So with our data portal, yeah, we would be willing, we're happy to accept um, data that's been collected previously and new data. And in facilitating collection of new data, we'd love to help, you know, when, when we talked about, um, uh, sorry, when we talked about um, coming up with readme files and those sorts of things, you know, right now those are internal to, to geos and GIF teams, but we think, you know, making something like that more publicly available and shared so that folks know and are aware of, you know, of all the things to be paying attention to and recording before, during, and after field work, because you know we all have so many things going on that it's it's uh, it's easy to overlook some things without realizing it. So, yes, we would definitely we're definitely supportive of of contributing new data and old data, and also connecting to databases that already exist. Because a lot of universities have repositories um, that are, and, and NASA has repositories that are are good and are clear. And so, connecting to those so that we don't have to completely Redigest everything would be really helpful. Um, and then there was a second part to your question about <laughs> oh, community, getting the community to all use it. Yeah, and that's a that is a bigger question, and and Sarah might have more to say on that end. But yeah, because I I know people, you know, if repositories already exist, then that's great. And what we what I think is really helpful is having a reposit having a data portal like ours where it can search all those repositories and it is one place to go to and is known as a place to go for the community to use. <clears throat> I'm not saying USGS has to fill that role. I'm saying that we are capable of filling that role and we've filled that roles in other in other aspects of, of planetary science. And so yeah, I think that is a question for the community. What is it that we can help with or that some NASA or some other entity can help with to facilitate this um, kind of community gathering and making a site that people want to use and that people will use. You know, that's really, that's a question we have too for the community. I don't know if anybody has other comments on that. We'd I'd love to hear them. I'll read one out from Sarah in the chat. And thanks for that response to Elise. Sarah adds, uh, in the case of, um, I might butcher this acronym. Do you pronounce it ARADS? Um, I would say the majority of it is retroactive as a dead log slash sample creation array and then on the function of the full sequence of operations in the field. And we find ourselves merging manually collected notes as a user friendly spreadsheet, timeline, record of drilling and sampling progress. Uh, thanks, Sarah. And uh, I don't know if you're able to unmute. Feel free to jump in if you'd like to add on more to that, or we can keep communicating from the chat as well. Hi, it's Darlene. I have a comment, but I wanted to raise my hand, but for some reason, my Zoom is not enabling me to do so. I apologize. I don't know if somebody else wants to go ahead of me. No? Okay. I, I just have a, um, it's not really a, solution or anything, but it's a couple of comments around some things that we run into in our team. So 
we find that in terms of data sharing, you know, the number one um, action that we'll try and take is to publish. Um, and uh, we'll publish, you know, tables of data, as much raw data as we feel comfortable, as much as the publication in you know, a journal will feel is, is okay for them to put out there as well. But then after that, you know, we, you, you kind of get by by the hair of your chinny chin chin once you're, you've got just enough money to kind of get people to the end of that publication realm. And then, then that's it. And you're sort of at a cliff at that point in time. Um, having the, the bandwidth to then um, make sure that the data is archived somewhere which is accessible to the community and so forth. Like we're, if we're in a, you know, a flight mission scenario, for example, there would be budget set, set aside allocated for that particular act to make sure that there was compatibility, to make sure that there was accessibility and so forth. We don't have that in our budgets. Um, and, or at least we don't have it in the budgets that I've been working with when it comes to analog missions. And so, um, that, you know, that may be something as a community that we feel strongly we want to make sure that there is a repository, a centralized repository, that we somehow uh, ask for that, that we, we put that forward as a need in future funding calls or something to that effect. Um, because I can certainly tell you that our reality is that once, you know, once you get that acceptance, you're like, phew, okay, I'm done. I did my, I did what was you know expected of me in terms of getting my data and my findings out there uh, into perpetuity, and that that you know checks all sorts of boxes, including archiving from from a, a research perspective. Um, so not a solution, but just a um, a consideration that you know we we just we'd love to find a mechanism to to be better able to to do archiving for sure. Okay, that's it. Yeah, I absolutely agree, Darlene. And I, I, I don't know the perfect solution yet, but I agree that it, um, it should somehow be integrated into the, the, propo the proposal process so that, um, you know, maybe providing some sort of, of training for folks and, you know, in calls for proposals, including language um, to let people know that they, um, about archiving requirements and that they need to include, they should include funding for the time it takes to archive. I, you know, I don't think it's something we can implement right away. And I don't know, you know, I'm, I don't work for NASA. I don't know on that side about um, more um, kind of requirements and how, how there could be accountability for folks. Um, but yeah, I think that's a conversation that's important to be having and that we should, we should keep in mind and, yeah, hopefully the community can move forward on that. Well, I have a question for Ben. Um, so Ben, I really liked your presentation and talking about um, kind of risk, you know, recording everything for basically, you know, for science, but also for the historical value of things. And the examples you gave were kind of larger field campaigns or larger, um, yeah, larger campaigns with either, you know, survey teams or at the Nutra Buoyancy Lab, there's a lot of people involved. Do you have any advice for maybe small teams or low budget teams, how they can best um, record things for, uh, Kind of uh, in the manner you've described. Sure, it's that's a great question. It's a, it's uh, I guess that everybody internalizes the idea of that your data might be more useful than what you think you're going to use it for, and what could you do to make sure that it you know as you put the photos in the shoebox as it were you organize them in some way for for someone else. Because uh, one thing we've seen in in Apollo and even in the uh, field training they did on Apollo, th that material and footage and stuff that you saw in Noah's presentation this morning, um, you never, we wouldn't have anticipated that we needed to find things out that we do from it. Um, so uh, one way to do it is to just make sure that when you're gathering your data, you are uh, putting it somewhere permanent residence. Uh, I think often like for something like a PDARC, uh, that you can even just use GitHub for that. Um, some place where it's accessible to people, it's documented a little bit, doesn't have to be super documented. Um, and often it's gonna be whatever comes off the instrument. And unless you're really interested in moving up that, those data levels that I introduced, 
Um, you could just keep them as what they are. And as long as they're all cataloged, that's going to be really valuable to somebody in the future. If you wanted to go one step further, you could uh, go to go to a good measure to make sure that uh, all the clocks uh, on different instruments are all synchronized and set correctly. Um, for example, on that first rise um, analog, none of the GoPro's clocks, well, I mean, a GoPro resets to like 2013 every time you change the battery. So it's a real pain to set the clock properly. So, and, you know, but maybe you take that 30 seconds before you run the, the video footage to make sure it's the current time of day. That actually can be really useful later on. Um, so anyway, I can carry on about things like that, but any little thing you can do, and this is like the, the same, uh, the lesson is, you know, early requirements into a mission to say, hey, could you just gather the data in this particular way? It doesn't add much scope to what needs to be built into a mission, but doing it after you've collected all the data and you realize you haven't done it in a certain way, takes a huge amount of effort to try to reconcile um, the problem after it has been, has been caused. So just keep your, keep your eye on that and, and I think you could go a long way. Cool, yeah, thanks for that. Yeah, sometimes it's tough because you don't know, <laughs> I don't know what a phrase that's right. You don't know what you don't know until you yeah. don't know it. So yeah, right. if, yeah, you don't always know what's gonna be the most useful, but uh, yeah, some of those are really good considerations to keep in mind. Thanks. Uh, Noah, you've got your hand up, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to piggyback on something Ben said that I learned from, from Ben Feist in the field is there's a free app, at least for the, the iPhone called Time, that lets you have time at the like the, the tenth of second scale. And if you just take a picture with your field camera of that and take a you know hold that up in the field of view of your camera, that becomes a moment that is captured. You can synchronize, you say, ah, I know that I took that picture. You can calculate the clock drift. If you're go for a recess to 2013, and you know that you just photographed that uh, clock at you know july 21st 2021 at 4 26 p.m eastern and you see well the metadata says this but i know the reality is this there's a six three year ten week two hour and ten second delay between the two 